This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So uh, I'm calling the Finance Committee meeting of um, July 14, 2020 to order at 1.40 p.m. And uh, this is a meeting that is being held electronically by remote participation pursuant to the governor's um, order that um, allows meetings to be held during this period of time because of the state of emergency with joint participation. It's an exception to the standard open meeting law. Um, I am, is, because we're meeting by joint participation, I'm gonna ask each member of the finance committee to indicate that um, they have heard me and, can, uh, and we can confirm that they can be heard when they say present. At that point, I am going to ask um, President Reese to call the um, council to order because there's also a quorum of council members and she will have to confirm for uh, the council members that they can also be heard. So have done that uh, statement to begin with. Um, Kathy Shane? Yes, I'm here and can hear you. Uh, Bob Hagner. I'm here. Lynn Griesmer. Here. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Here. Dorothy Pam. Present. Uh, Mary Lou Tomlin. Here. And Sharon Pavanelli. Here. I think that I have um, all of the members of the Finance Committee that have confirmed that they um, can participate fully in the meeting. So the meeting is uh, called to order and uh, uh, Lynn, would you like to call the council to order? Yeah. Seeing as we have a quorum of the council at the finance committee meeting on July 14th, I'm calling the council to order at 142. I would like to check with the additional council members that they can hear me and we can hear them. George Ryan. I'm present. Um, uh, Mandy Johanneke. Present. Darcy Dumont. Yes. I believe that was it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to for a moment put the um, agenda on the um, screen if I'm able to do so. And um, unfortunately, I'm running into problems. So I'm going to go back and um, not try and share. And if uh, Lynn's able to do so, she will put it on the screen briefly. But um, there are um, several segments to the meeting. We have um, presentations from several departments about their budgets. We are going to start with the, um, if you look at, thank you, Lynn, if you look at the um, agenda item three, fiscal 21 budget, other matters as determined, we decided that we would um, ask the um, police chief to come back because we had provided several questions for the budget for the police chief and we want to get uh, to them. Then we have presentations on the general budget and debt sections of the budget, which we need to consider. Um, in order to complete our budget review process. Um, after that, uh, those presentations, we will open it up for a period of public comment um, of uh, allowing public to comment from one to three minutes um, uh, of time. The num number of minutes will depend upon the amount of time and then uh, we will also want to talk about just the budget review and recommendation process that, we're on, that is underway. Um, so um, it is the agenda that you see before you, but it is uh, not, um, not in order 
but since it's um, all been posted, I think that's appropriate. Um, and uh, that's how we are going to proceed with the meeting. So, Lynn, I think we can go back from to a regular view for the moment. And um, I uh, th thank you, Chief Livingstone, for um, uh, being at the meeting today. And I see that you have uh, at least one other, uh, two other officers, uh, two of the captains who are with us also to answer questions that may come from the uh, committee and the council. But um, I wanted to first start by uh, and if you have anything that you can comment on the three questions that we had sent to you about uh, mostly staffing and uh, patrolling issues. Sure, so thanks, you, thanks Mr. Steinberg and thanks to the uh, finance committee for having us back. And um, again, I don't, I don't know what time frame you wanted us to withhold or hold to, Andy. So if we're going a little long-winded, don't be afraid to interject or tell us to move along. But we'll try to stick to those three specific questions that you had originally sent to me. Um, one regarding staffing and what our staffing um, gets broken down in and who, how it looks on day-to-day -day operations. Captain Young will talk a little bit about the organizations that we partner with those consist of and then I'll follow up with vacancies and what our expectations are throughout the FY21 um, process that pertains to manpower and maybe some other little things in there and if you have questions that'll be great. So um, I'll turn it over to Captain Ting and he can talk about some staffing issues. Gabe? Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, basically our operations and the structure of the Amherst Police Department you know, relative to staffing. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions in terms of, uh, you know, what our roles are for the different police departments that we have within the town of Amherst, and I just want to explain some of those roles. Um, so the jurisdictional boundaries for the different police agencies in Amherst and the differences. So for the Amherst Police, um, our jurisdictional boundaries include all public ways and private ways that are open to invitees within the town of Amherst. Um, the University of Massachusetts is, their police department's a state entity. Um, so any state property belonging to UMass Amherst or neighboring towns would fall within their authority. It also extends to contiguous streets that cross through the campus such as North Pleasant Street. Um, the Amherst College Police Department is a private entity uh, so any property in Amherst that is privately owned by Amherst College would be patrolled by them. And Hampshire College no longer has a sworn police force. They are now um, uh, patrolled by a security team that only patrols Hampshire College property. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of what the difference is between each of the police departments, uh, the Amherst Police has 48 budgeted sworn officers. All Amherst police officers must attend a full-time municipal police academy or equivalent consisting of the current platform of 26 weeks of instruction. And funding for that agency comes from the town of Amherst. The University Police Department, they have 62 budgeted sworn police officers and all UMass officers must attend also a full-time municipal level police academy or equivalent consisting of the current platform of 26 weeks. Um, funding for that agency comes from the state. Uh, the difference there is they cannot enforce Amherst Town bylaws and they don't patrol, they do not patrol uh, town streets and properties. The Amherst College Police Department, they have 13 budgeted sworn officers. So all Amherst College police officers must attend a 14 week special state police academy or campus um, academy. So this academy would not meet the acceptable requirements for a municipal police department. They do not possess chapter 90 authority, which means they don't have the authority to pull cars over and issue uh, Massachusetts civil motor vehicle citations. Um, so any major felonies such as sexual assaults or death investigations or anything, um, any major incidents are investigated by the Amherst Police Department. So that's an agreement that we have with their agency. They just don't have the resources for it. And they also cannot enforce Amherst Town bylaws. Uh, Hampshire College, uh, again, they don't have a police department. 
So anything of any significance is falls upon our responsibility to handle. So we do uh, go there when we're called, but we don't actively patrol their campus. So our current staffing levels, uh, again, 48 full-time sworn police officers. We currently have one vacancy. So we just had three uh, recruit officers that just graduated on Friday. Their first day was yesterday. So they are now uh, in their field training process, which consists of three months of field training and one year of probationary status. So the current staffing for us is we have one uh, chief of police, two captains, one administrative, one operational, um, four lieutenants, three of them are patrol lieutenants, and one is a detective lieutenant. And we currently have seven sergeants, seven of them are on patrol. When I say patrol, I mean uniform division, and one detective sergeant. In terms of uh, patrol officers, we have 28 patrol officers and five detectives. Um, normally we have six, but one was just promoted and moved to the patrol ranks. And we also have two canines. Um, so just to give you a description of what our shifts look like, uh, we have three traditional shifts, which is uh, 8 to 4, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 4 p.m. to midnight, and midnight to 8. And usually when we have additional staffing, sometimes we have a swing shift, which is 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Um, uh, our minimum essential personnel on the streets uh, essentially is one sergeant and three patrol officers and one station officer. So you have a total of five officers um, in total. The University Police Department, for example, they have one supervisor and three patrol officers, also one station officer. Uh, Amherst College Police, on a regular basis, they only have one supervisor and one patrol officer for their campus. So we have a system in place that's called no time off weekends. And that's specifically uh, catered towards the academic months for uh, the university. So during the academic months, there are certain weekends that we determine to be, we call them NTOs. Um, so a regular NTO weekend begins on Thursday from four o'clock p.m. and ends on Sunday at 8 a.m. So our NTOs are regulated through collective bargaining agreements uh, between the town and the patrolman supervisors unions. And what that is, is we've had that for the past 25 years or so. Um, uh, certainly been there ever since I've been here. And over those years, the academic months sprinkled with holidays and long weekends have produced high level of activity trends that we're able to forecast, engage. The activity from these past weekends were examined by analyzing past statistics, uh, event plans, weather forecasts, and after action reports. So these no time off weekends are a measure to ensure that our staffing levels are acceptable to handle all of those activities. Um, so during NTOs, the department will not honor any vacation requests. We don't honor any uh, compensatory time or personal time off. Uh, however, if there's a hardship um, and time off is absolutely necessary, approval is decided by the chief of police. Uh, sick and family sick is certainly allowed. Um, during NTOs, all scheduled shifts are mandatory and any open shifts due to sick or family sick or authorized time off will be filled in order to have a full staff. So, you know, we utilize no NTOs to make sure that we have enough staffing every single weekend. And our weekends are certainly really busy during the academic year. Um, events that we consistently plan for in the fall are student move-in. Uh, certainly those first two weeks are extremely busy with um, college kids not having many classes to go to or, or that many obligations. So it's kind of like party central for the first two weeks. So it's really busy. And that follows us into the Halloween weekend. Um, and during the fall certainly we have UMass tailgating and football games and homecoming weekends and town common events and events from the Amherst High School. And certainly when there's large celebratory gatherings, whenever there's a championship from uh, one of our major sports, there's usually some kind of event at the university that we have to assist with. Uh, in the springtime, some of the big events that we plan for are the Blarney Blowout, uh, the UMass Spring Concert Weekend, 
uh, UMass and Amherst College graduations, student move out, town common events, and again, Amherst High School events. So our staffing level during NTOs, you know, I, I mentioned what we have for minimums, but usually during NTOs, we will have uh, probably about six to eight officers at a maximum. So um, usually we have uh, one supervisor and one OIC, and OIC is an officer in charge, and that's the rank of a lieutenant for each shift. And generally, again, between six to eight patrol officers that we make sure are, are filled during our NTOs. However, the weekends when it's not uh, during the academic months, we just maintain our minimum shift. Um, so just to explain uh, what we have is uh, discretionary holdovers. So even with our best efforts to try and estimate activity, it's, it's oftentimes very unpredictable on a weekend and weekly basis. Uh, so additionally, when there are major incidents that occur, uh, usually uh, each call will consist of at least um, two officer, a two officer response. So when we're at our minimum, if there's two major incidents that are happening at one time, you know, our whole shift is depleted really quickly. So a lot of times we'll have to call in uh, backup resources or ask for our mutual aid partners to help out. Uh, so common reasons for those holdovers are busy weekend nights, uh, major incidents such as homicides, uh, unattended deaths, assaults, disturbances, large motor vehicle crashes and house fires, or again, multiple incidents in the same time period. Uh, any calls with safety concerns always require two officer response. Um, and of course, with any major incident, you know, we will require a detective bureau response, uh, potentially an administrative staff response you know, or responses from outside agencies such as the district attorney's office or the state police. So there's a, another question in terms of what type of organizations that, that we commonly work with. So the, uh, the most common agency that we work with is the Amherst Fire Department. Uh, since the police department has shifts of officers who are considered as first responders, uh, we're already out there patrolling the streets. So it only makes sense that we get dispatched to any medical or fire calls along with the Amherst Fire Department. So we are often uh, the first to arrive on scene to assess the situation. We report the findings and request resources. And after determining which agency should be the primary lead depending on the nature of the call, uh, either the Amherst Fire Department or the Amherst Police Department will then move to their trained roles given the circumstances. Um, other agencies that we work with regularly are hey, clinical. Hey, Gabe, can I interject and let Ronnie jump in on the um, specifics, the clinical support in those agencies? Absolutely. Thank you. Do you want to mention that or do you want me to continue over that? If Ron's still on. Can you hear me, Ron? Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay, great. I'm sorry about that. I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. Um, thank you, Gabe, very much for that. I know there were some questions, follow-up questions about some of the, the various organizations that we work with. Um, we do work with a lot of different municipal organizations, state-level organizations, court-level organizations, but I, I strike from reading the, uh, the email that the chief had sent me that we wanted to concentrate more on some of the service-oriented type things. So I'll touch on those and we, I can always expand further if we need to. Um, as Gabe had just said, that we obviously work with our brothers and sisters up at the fire department, and we do respond to a lot of uh, a lot of calls for service with them. And it is really not so much to do their job, but really to be the eyes and ears and maybe assess it very quickly to determine if there's a dangerous situation there, um, to determine what type of resources we might need. Um, we can give some notification back to the commanding officers back at the fire department to let them know what we're seeing so that they can assess and determine what their response level is going to be. Um, whether it be a traffic accident, structure fire, medical emergency, something of that nature. Um, as it relates to uh, mental health response, uh, there were some questions the other day or the other evening about exactly how our relationship with uh, CSO works. Um, so I, I just would cover that briefly again. We employ the CIT model here, which is which is 
based on the on the Memphis model, there are very there's various forms of a CIT that are employed by various you know different police departments across the country. We being a smaller agency, the Memphis model seems to work for us. Um, the way that works is we train 100% of our people here in mental health first aid. Um, there's a requirement by the Department of Mental Health uh, to do that, and then subsequent to that, we train all of our supervisors and about 25% of our staff on the CIT and or the what BHN or Behavioral Health Network has identified as a 40-hour training session. Um, again, I, I, there was a lot of a lot of discussion that was made the other night about my statement that we don't try to be clinicians, and that in fact is the truth. We are we are not clinicians, and that's not what our response is, is about. Our response really is um, is is about crisis stabilization. Um, we respond for family support reasons to determine whether or not there's some type of safety issues that are there and really just work towards crisis stabilization until we can get some assistance. Um, we work very closely with CSO, uh, Clinical Support Options, which is in Northampton, based in Northampton, which they in turn uh, have a working relationship with the Department of Mental Health. Of course, the Hamden County version of that is Behavioral Health Network, and again, the two of them work hand in hand. And, and in fact, our TTAC is based at BHN, and that's where we, we, we get all of our training from and get our officers trained up in current. We've also trained our dispatchers up for call response, and that call response looks a lot different, and our call taking responsibilities look a lot different than they did even a couple of years ago. Um, when a CIT officer's response, um, it makes the calls a lot more complex than they used to be. Um, our departmental directive and our orders here are directed to our sergeants um, to allow the CIT officers to remain on the scene for a protracted period of time if necessary. Again, we're, we're not looking at, at, at solving the problem. We're just looking at harm reduction and stabilizing that person until we get somebody of a higher level of training to come and assist them. Another thing that I wanted to note about CIT and our response that I, I probably did not cover the other night was the reasons why we respond to calls like that. Really, we could ca carve it down to about three different reasons why we respond to whether it be a mental health or mental illness response or somebody who may be suffering from some type of some type of uh, medical problems that relates to overdosing. We either respond because there's an underlying crime that's been reported to the police department, but more frequently we respond because of self-reporting, either some that the person calls and is looking for assistance or a family member calls. So typically when we respond down to a call like that, um, we really don't know what we're going into or the other side of that, it's a call that we've been to more frequently and the officer is recognized or perhaps the patient would ask in, for a specific officer because they've developed some type, of, um, some type of rapport with them over the years or months or weeks or whatnot. Coupled with that, we, we deal with, uh, we deal with our, the Hampshire Hope in Northampton. Um, they are the ones who have assisted us in outlining what our DART program is, our drug addiction response team. Again, that is a harm reduction model. Um, we are not responding to those calls for service to try and solve people's problems. We're really there to try and make certain that people get to where they need to be, whether it need to be a hospital to a recovery coach, um, to some other type of um, service that might be available to them. We do, you will note that, and I know the captain had talked about it earlier about some of our calls for service. You're gonna note that we do a lot of self-initiated calls in these areas. We do follow up, it's part of our, it's part of our protocol, it's part of the model that we follow, it's part of what our training entails, and it's part of what DMH and um, Hampshire Hope have required from us as part of our grant funding. So typically what we'll do is we'll contact somebody who has been who's been in contact with us in the past to find out if there are other resources that we can put them in touch with. Are there other support options that are available for us? Are there other safety protocols? Um, lots of times there's some things that are tied in with these calls that go beyond just what maybe what their behavioral health or the mental health or the substance disorders um, have first indicated there might be some safety concerns. Sometimes there's some financial issues. Sometimes they need to clear up warrants, things along those lines. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on as it relates to both, both, the, both these types of calls. The program that we belong to is entitled the Jail Diversion Program. The JDP was designed so that we don't arrest people for some of these underlying minor crimes, or if we're able to divert these crimes to get people to where they need to be short of arresting them, that's what we do. Um, I don't have specific numbers here, but I could provide those. 
of calls if we looked at going back some eight, nine years ago to calls that we typically respond to low level calls like disturbances and things of that nature, where the person may have been charged with a crime or arrested and taken to the House of Corrections, they're now taken to the ED, they're taken to CSO, um, they're brought to detox, um, they're hooked up with somebody that could possibly help them, even if they're not in crisis, but get some things in order so that they possibly could be in a better spot the following day. And I, I see that as a win as from our agency. Um, clinically, we also deal with the courts. Um, we deal with ServiceNet, we deal with safe passages. Um, on the domestic violence level, um, we deal with the Center for Women and Children. They're our rape crisis center here in town. Um, we have partnered with them for the last number of years. Um, as the chief had mentioned the other night during our presentation, uh, we actually have a, uh, a person who's in bed here in our, in our agency. This civilian advocate is housed here in our, in, in our department. Um, she is highly trained, very well educated, and is a private and not a public entity. In other words, the things that she deals with are, uh, in terms of sharing information, is very limited. Um, she is here and it is very clear that she is here for the persons who are victim and survivors of both sexual and domestic violence. Um, she assists those people in being hooked up with uh, various different organizations like NELQUIT, Victim Witness Advocacy, Office of Elder Affairs, Safe Passages, ServiceNet, et cetera, et cetera, to try to, again, we're looking at harm reduction, we're looking at stabilization of the family unit, we're looking at trying to prevent difficult situations down the road, and we're looking at safety plan. Um, she is she's an integral part of who we are as an agency, and um, a lot of that is grant funded. It comes out of a program that we've partnered with the Department of Justice for the last couple of years, and we are just we are currently waiting to see whether or not that grant will be refunded in the future. Back to you, Gabe. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Actually, I, I, I'd like to interrupt. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, oh, please. Um, Andy, would it make sense for Julie to weigh in now from the different perspective on this? Because Ron had brought up that topic and it was a concern of the council about the, uh, the interagency inter interaction. Julie, do you have anything that you want to offer? You're, uh, you're, muted. you're muted, muted, Julie. Yes, thank you for asking me. Um, I have several things I want to talk about, but I'll talk specifically about um, some of the things Ron was just talking about um, because I'm so Hold happy. On. Uh, Julie, just um, to introduce, I, we need to introduce you to any members oh. of the public who are watching who don't uh, know who you are. Uh, Julie Fetterman is the director of the public health department in town. So thank you, Julie. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and Paul, should I um, talk about various things I was going to speak about or just this issue? Paul? Up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know, but time is short, so we need to be brief on this, short. I think. Okay. So I'm going to jump in here and um, try and be short. But one of the things, so first of all, I'll just talk about what um, some of the things that, that Ron was talking about. So I have worked for the town since 1995 as public health nurse, then assistant director, and the director for the past 10 years. Uh, and so one of the things I've had the privilege of doing is working with our police department. Uh, because one of the things that we've tried to do for a very long time out of the health department is the concept of bringing um, health into all matters of the town. And so the police department, along with other departments, were great about um, really embracing that concept. So um, about in 2014, I think it was Amherst and four other towns um, joined together to get grant funding to help create a coalition to address the opioid epidemic, which became the Hope Coalition. Um, I initially served on that executive committee and then it seemed to make a lot more sense to have someone from the police department. And so um, they stepped up to the plate and um, from almost the beginning have been deeply embedded into the HOPE Coalition. So when Ron is talking about the DART team that was created um, the, and uh, the efforts of the police department over overdoses, I kind of wanted to flesh that out for you. So you've got someone who ODs and um, 
police officers have been trained how to administer Narcan in case they're first on the scene, right? Because a lot of times police are first on the scene. They don't, as, they're, as Ron's saying, we don't know what's going to happen. So maybe an ambulance hasn't been called. Um, so they have the capability of administering Narcan, which prevents a death. Um, they then have developed a team, uh, officers who will go back the next day or whatever is appropriate to where that person lives and check on that person. It's a warm knock. How you doing? Because we all know that when get, you get someone has just been given Narcan and is waking up, it's not really the time to talk about, hey, what's the next step in reducing perhaps your, the, the, the concept of having the next overdose? So I just really applaud the fact that our police department really stepped up to want to be part of this. Um, it was a new role for police departments. And I think it's a perfect example of what our police department is willing to do. Um, I'll talk about another way in which we collaborate, and that's with um, our homeless systems meeting. So again, um, we've had a Craig's Doors in our town now for, I want to say, nine years. Um, they run a, a shelter. We also have other entities in town who serve our homeless population as outreach workers. Um, and we decided that it, it made sense to bring folks together to kind of convene st stakeholders, people who work with homeless folks, and then um, town officials to meet once a month and talk about what's coming up in the community, what's coming up at the shelter among our homeless folks. And the police have really been integral in that. Um, again, uh, Captain Ting has been part of that. Um, and before him, Jen Gunderson, um, they're at the table, the communication is happening, it's going back and forth from those serving the homeless to the police and from the police back to them. Um, I've just been so impressed in the ways we've been able to work together like that. Um, since this may be my only other opportunity to speak, one of the reasons I really wanted to speak was because Public health pub and public safety are crucial during this pandemic. I really urge you to respond to issues that are being brought up as opposed to react. We need our police department. Um, I also want you to know that I am passionate about injustice and its impact on people's health. Our, the Amherst Health Department's had a long history of understanding and seeking to address racial disparities in health access and also addressing biases. Personally, I've sought out training and education around racism and my role as a white American and a government official. Most recently, I was chosen to participate in a statewide training program with the town manager's full support. I've committed to bringing the concepts of cultural humility to our town governance, most recently to our hiring practices, along with the town manager's support. I'm now endeavoring to bring the concept of white fragility forward to town leaders that we can all engage in this process that's ongoing. As the speaker said last night, it's not about one single training. And the reason I'm giving you that background about myself is that's who I am. And when as a professional as a, and also as a resident of Amherst. So when I'm working with the police department, the fire department, town hall, this is the lens I bring to it. So I care passionately about what's happening to people of color around this country in Massachusetts. But I also know that we have a police department that is above par and who are really committed to serving this community and open to what comes next. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Chief, do you have anything else? To yeah. end? Just your last question, Andy, um, that was specific to where we stand as far as um, vacancies and uh, potential vacancies in FY21. So I think Captain Ting mentioned that we do currently have one vacancy now. Uh, we will have a second vacancy as early as July 24th, so basically in a week. And we have another vacancy that will be happening on September 1st. Those are all vacancies that we know of. Um, FY21, we have two officer, two more officers who would qualify for retirement as well. So three definites, potentially more. And that's just for retirement purposes. Um, we have had officers leave for other agencies. Um, 
most recently we had one leave for the Mass State Police and we had one leave for the Rhode Island State Police. So those occur not as frequently, but um, so that's kind of where we are in a staffing level perspective. Um, I think that covers the three questions you wanted. Andy, I didn't know if there was additional information. Um, I don't, but, um, but the next thing I'm gonna do um, is open it up to questions from members of the Finance Committee and members of the Council, and we'll recognize hands as they come uh, from councillors and uh, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, the, uh, just so that other councillors who hadn't seen the questions uh, are, I mean, it's fairly obvious. What we were looking for was sort of that question that's always the budget question. Um, we know how much we're spending. What, what, does it, what does it essentially provide for the community, what we're spending? That's, those were the focus of the question. Gotcha. And that's really the focus of the discussion today. And I appreciate very much the uh, responses that we have received from uh, Chief Livingstone and from Captain Young and Captain Ting. Um, Kathy, I do see your hand up, and since I said no, I would, that would be the next segment. Uh, first. Hey, um, thank you very much uh, for responding and also for responding to other questions. Um, I will resend the set that I don't think has been answered yet that aren't budget related. But I, I just wanted to follow up on the vacancy question to make sure I understood. Um, when you said one now, one in a few weeks, and then another one, those are vacancies where you don't, you haven't currently identified a trainee that you're bringing in. Um, so those are genuine. You would be starting a process to hire people. I know you, we often front the training costs. And so someone is in pipeline is not maybe the right word, but you know, on their way, sure. Sure. but they're genuine. You haven't started figuring out what you're going to do with those yet. I mean, other than you know they're going to be vacant. Right. So we had started, Kathy, we had started the recruitment process probably last January. We tried to get a head start on anticipated vacancies because it takes close to a year from the time we start interviewing to the time an academy is finished before that person is actually working. So, you know, it's not unusual for us to have one or two vacancies because we're at the Liberty or at the, um, the state police run um, academies, you know, the one in Western Mass only runs twice a year. So if you miss out on that, it's another it's six to eight months before you can get an officer into that academy. So, you know, where there's a lot of planning that's involved, psychological exams, interviews and all that stuff. So the process to hire just one officer is about a year long process. And can I just follow up on it? Um, in terms of meeting uh, standards for police departments on who you can hire yes. and have in one of the two, if you're sending out a team of two, is uh, does do state regs allow you to have someone that didn't come through the state police academy but came through a different route, um, you know, a behavioral health route, a, a crisis management route, the kind of person that you've got right now grant funded. Yes. Would that be a part of the police force in a team of two where the other person is an officer? Um, I think I kind of know where you're going with. They wouldn't have, obviously, wouldn't have any police powers. They could act as an advocate. Um, it's a little touchy only because it's the Captain Young mentioned when we get sent to a call, that's a mental health type call. We don't always know it's that. So there is a level of safety. Um, I don't know how easy it would be just to have them riding along in a cruiser uh, and respond to that type of call. But certainly if somebody was available to us to respond at some point within that call, that would be beneficial. Um, it's one of the it's one of the issues we're facing with entities like CSO, ServiceNet, uh, one of the reasons the police department is kind of in responsible for all of these responses is because we're there 24 seven and they're not. Um, we just had an incident yesterday where we had a mom come to us in the lobby of the police station because she couldn't get hold of anyone at CSO and she needed immediate assistance with us with a son. So 
those are the types of issues that even we have as an agency trying to get the coordination with our partners at CSO and ServiceNet and that sort of thing. I think it's somewhere we'd like to be, but it's going to be a long process. Okay, thank you. That no answered. Problem. Yeah, so maybe I'll do a follow up question on uh, turning it to a second to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I know you have often said, and I've in from my own experience as a former legal aid attorney, two officers going to a uh, domestic violence call, would it be advisable um, in, in your estimation on a domestic violence call to bring along somebody from uh, a domestic violence organization, including the one you currently work with, or is that something that happens later in the process? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, domestic violence calls are one of the more dangerous calls that police officers respond to. There were just two officers murdered at a domestic violence call in Southern Texas two days ago. Um, no, I certainly have an advocate available. I mean, the process we have in place right now works great. The advocate is here um, 20 or 24 hours a week. She does all of the follow-up with the victims and that sort of thing, but um, for their actual response, um, typically, she would get involved when we bring the, if there's an arrest made, we would start the process there. If there's no arrest made, if the suspect has fled the scene and we bring the victim back to the police station, she would be involved at the police station, but not at the residence. Okay, thank you. Um, there are several other uh, counselors who've asked to be recognized. I just uh, should note that when I was in legal aid, we, there were two times when we most frequently um, were working with police officers. One was uh, before we were ever involved when the initial response came in, and the other was if there was a violation of a restraining order. Yes. And violations of restraining orders at that point, we were representing the um, victim frequently, but uh, police officer interventions, and those can be also from what I observed in my legal aid days, an equally uh, precarious time for police response. Yeah, and that's kind of why the state changed the law so that when police officers respond to domestic violence type calls, the preferred response by law, by statute with our district attorney's office is, is an arrest. So the days of just going to do a domestic violence call and keeping the peace are kind of long gone. Um, the preferred response is an arrest. Okay, I'm gonna um, recognize other members of the um, council for a few minutes and then I uh, um, see that uh, Chief Nelson also has something that he'd like to say. So um, I will in, uh, bring G, uh, Chief Nelson from the fire department along in a few minutes, but um, Mandy Haneke, you had your um, hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I apologize if I missed the answer to this, um, but you know, we've been talking about the grant funding that mm -hmm. came in 2015 or so for um, combating, combating domestic violence and sexual violence and stalking. Um, and it seemed that in the budget book that that, um, paid for a detective or some sort of personnel. When is that grant supposed to end? And if it ends, what's happening to that position that's been paid for? Is that is that folded into the budget right now? Is it not? Is that position going away? Can you talk a little bit more about that? And like I said, sure. I apologize if I missed the answer to this earlier. <laughs> no, actually, Mandy, Joe, there, your timing on that question is perfect because that grant is in the process. Uh, well, I'll let Ron explain if he's still. Ron, are you still here? I am, Sir Chief. Um, so that we are in the final months of that grant. Um, it expires at the end of the federal fiscal year, so the, uh, September 30. Um, we reapplied back in, in, in January for a continuation of the grant, which would be based on a 36-month model. Typically, we hear back about that somewhere in August or early September, right before the federal fiscal year begins, the next F federal fiscal year. I'm waiting on my hands to see whether or not it will come back, but if it does, it will extend it for either 48 or, um, I scratch that, for 24 to 36 months, depending on what the award is. 
So if we don't receive the funding for that grant, we expect we're going to see, receive the funding at least to cover the cost of the officer. Uh, if we don't, that's gonna be a discussion we're going to need to have with the town manager and the finance committee, I'm guessing. Thank you. Anything else, Lynn, uh, Mandy? If not, not at this time, no. Okay, Lynn, um, and then I was gonna ask Chief Nelson if he had anything, and then Dorothy Pam in that order. So Lynn? Um, yes. One of the questions that has been out there is what are initiated calls in, in the little bit of, um, you know, response on that, what I've determined is that not all, but some are follow-up calls. And I wonder if there is a way, you know, for example, um, we have one neighborhood that has often has a fair amount of weekend partying happens to be in my district. And the uh, officer Laramie, who is working with the university on issues like that, will often then go by the house on the day after the, yeah. or maybe the Monday after the party, and talk with the people. And that's called an initiated call versus follow up. Right. And I'm wondering if there is a way to de to classify that, and if you could give us a sense of the initiated calls, how many are really follow up calls where you're checking back. Right, so thanks for that question, Lynn. And, you know, I watched last night's council meeting and of all the comments that I heard, that was the theme of the, what, the misunderstanding of what those officers do was um, really kind of disheartening um, because it, the implication was that we were going and targeting specific neighborhoods and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it is actual officer responsible follow-ups and it's geared by calls. So for instance, on Phillips Street, and maybe I should let Gabe answer this as well, but you know, there's a lot of follow-up on Phillips Street and there's a lot of follow-up at the um, shelter when it's open and that sort of thing. Gabe, where are you? Are you still there? Oh, well, Gabe, you wanna yeah. jump in on that? Yeah, I'm here. I, I know that there, there's a, a lot of questions relative to the areas uh, that we commonly police and why. Um, so the structure of our, of our operations is that we follow a sector-based problem-oriented community policing model. So we stress proactivity, uh, which kind of initiates um, officer-initiated activity. So um, we stress that to prevent problems before they happen, to make sure we do a proper job following up with our investigations uh, in efforts to further that prevention. Um, the efforts that we make are to target the source of the problems and not based on ethnicity, race, sex, or class. So our officer initiated activity is really predicated on the problems identified in every neighborhood in Amherst. So how do we find out about those problems? We learn about the problems when people call in for help or for, for service really. So the self initiation is a responsive measure or follow up for that effort of problem solving. So for example, if you were to take a look at some statistics, I know that there was um, some questions in terms of um, how often do we patrol North Pleasant Street or the apartment complexes comparatively to more affluent neighborhoods. So if you were to take a look at statistics, for example, if you were to take a look at Wildflower uh, in Amherst Woods. So in 2019, for example, there were two total calls from um, residents off of that street alone. Uh, one call was for an animal complaint, one call was for a medical mental call. Um, we often get complaints of speeders and traffic issues there. So we have a total of five officer initiated calls in that street alone. And four of them were for traffic and speed enforcement, one was for a citizen transport. So really what I'm trying to articulate here is that, you know, our officer initiated activity is predicated on, you know, what type of issues are in that neighborhood. So if I was to give you another example, Colonial Village is, is an area that we commonly respond to. Uh, in 2019, there was a total of 80 calls. And if you were to take a look at the makeup of those calls, there were 33, 33 medical assists, 14 well-being checks, 13 domestics, uh, 13 medical mental calls, nine suspicious activity, eight noise complaints, four disturbances, and then a variety of other calls. So our total officer initiated calls there 
were um, 80 calls there. Um, so our officers that went there to initiate, they, it consists of 60 security checks, 19 follow-ups, and one warrant service. So again, what I'm trying to articulate and illustrate here is that, you know, we're not targeting any particular neighborhood for the purpose of targeting people. You know, our sole response is to target the problems at hand. And so, you know, our initiated responses are, again, predicated on what the issues are and the calls for service. I hope that answers your question. Um, I think it's particularly helpful when you give examples without finger pointing or anything else. Um, so I particularly appreciated the Colonial Village, but I wanna go back and say, you referred to that as 80 calls. Was that 80 calls you received and then you initiated follow-up? Uh, let me take a look at my stats here. Yes, we, we received uh, 80 calls in total. I'm just trying to look at my computer system here. And then there were roughly 80 initiated responses, officer initiated responses. Okay, so and then, then we got the sense from the various uh, people last night who came forth to talk to the council. Um, <laughs> they felt that there was just more police presence in places like Colonial Village, apartment complexes. Um, and so in addition to the calls that you originally responded to and the follow-up, would you say that police cars are therefore going into that neighborhood in general to be a presence or are that if they are there is for the calls and the follow-up? I would say both, ma'am. Um, for instance, there was a, uh, a couple months ago, there was a there was an incident where there was a um, uh, a UMass student. She was an international student. She was of Asian descent, and there was uh, some BBs that were shot through her window. As long as as well as uh, she had a couple of roommates there, and so therefore we were trying to investigate that to determine if that was a targeted crime or if that was uh, of some other type of nature. So therefore. We did conduct a lot of follow-up. We also had a lot of police officers present in that area for several reasons. A, as a deterrent, and B, to try and figure out who the perpetrators were. And through our investigation, we did figure it out and it, it came to a resolution. But we did spend a lot of time there just for that one incident alone. So it, it's kind of both, you know, certainly for presence, um, for a deterrence and as well as a, a follow-up to the incident itself. So if you were to multiply that by how many calls and different problems that we have in that specific area, you know, we're going to have uh, quite a bit of response. So somebody who lives there, they're going to see a presence from the police there, but we're there for a specific reason. I, I urge that you find a way to classify follow-up calls of so that they're not seen only as initiated because mm -hmm. you initiate them, you're actually following up on a previous call. That was and, and they are actually classified within our database. Um, and those are statistics that can be produced. Okay. Thank you for that further explanation. You're very welcome. Okay. So what I was going to do, uh, Chief Nelson, uh, for, uh, did you have something that you wanted to uh, offer to the finance committee? Yes, I do. I can get this. On. There I go. Well, oh, you, you're here in person. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm here really because just, you know, the railing that's been going on specifically against the uh, Amherst uh, Police. police um, you know, all the laws talk, talk about the defund the, the funding the uh, police and, and that type, 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 type of thing. I think the, those folks need to take the time to understand what our police department does for, 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 for the community. They really take the time to find out what they do and how, how they do it. In my, my mind, this, you know, the stuff that, that the country is going through right now, 
it's not the police, it's policing. And there's a subtle di di difference there. And I, and I really believe, I sincerely believe that, that policing needs, needs to change. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 other, the other piece, piece is, is that, you know, the, the Amherst police, police, police Department, they're part of a team. They're part of a public safe, 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 safety team that that works well together. I, I, I came from another, another, another municipality. We, we, we work well with, 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 with the police, police there, but nothing like it is, is here. I was taken, taken aback by how close the fire and police, police, police department partners work with work here. And it's and, and it's a team that's work, working for, for, for the community. And I guess you know again to those folks that are that are coming come, come, coming out specifically against the you know, sort of police, police department, department. I ask you know what what has our police department done wrong in compare pair pairs of what's going on na na nash nash na nationally? Not no, no, nothing. They do it right. They there there are. Is some, something that should be and and the way that they do a great great they, they, they do a great job I mean sure so the, so can there can, can things thing be, be improved sure of course and every, every order or, or organization can, can can improve but and and, and the Amherst PD is not the Minnesota sort of police I mean the Minneapolis police it's not the Atlanta police, police, police part, 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 and they don't. That's not how they are, are, are operate. I mean, one of the one of the things that uh, Chief Livingston said, I think last last week, was that they haven't just dis, 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 discharged a weapon in 42 years. Uh, you know, and you know that's you know that's that has to be because they have found ways to the. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, escalate to situations. They, you know, they, uh, they're, they're legal, legal, they're humane, humane ways, ways to, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, escalate. I think you remember a few, few years, years ago, one, one, one of their off, off officers was confronted by a gentleman with a, a weapon that could have harmed, harmed him seriously, harmed harm him or himself seriously. In my, in my, my mind, he would have had every just, just, just justification to use his weapon, his weapon, his weapon, his weapon. But he, he, he didn't. He found a way around, around it. He found a way to DS escalate and not hurt for anyone. You know, the APD is not a threat, threat to this, this community. They're watching up for you. They're watching up for your families. They're watching up for those you care about. And you know what? They're watching up for my, my, my people too. My my job is to make make sure that my 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 folks are safe, and part 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 of that is our good relationship with the, with the AEPD. They're they they're they're with with, with us at most 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 calls, be it a fire 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 call, car ag, 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 accident, mental 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 health 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 call, which can be absolutely dangerous. And it's a good feel feeling our folks have to know that when they're going into into a situation. That could be kind of uh, ten, 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 tenuous or dangerous. APD is right there with us, watching out for us, so that we can do our our our, our job. These are good people. These are folks that care about us. This, this, this community. These, these are folks that stretch stretch themselves to the nth degree to take care of people. Period. That's 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 what they're 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 all all, all about. Um. You know, I've, I've been been in the fire fire service for 38 years now, about 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 that, 38, 30, 39, nine years, year, 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 years now. So, so, so for part part of my life, I've been fire 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 fire, 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 fire fighter. Uh, but before that, I was a black man, and when, once I'm through through here, I'm still going to be a black man. And that, and and you know that 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 is my entire 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 life there. You know, uh, the fire 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 side is part part of it. But there's, I'll tell you, there's not a day that goes by where you know in in my entire entire life there hasn't been a day that's gone gone by where someone has not reminded my reminded me that I'm di different. 
based on race. You know, and and it's you know it's you know white 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 people who, you know, I'm not saying that they're racist or that they're big, 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 big bigots, but they do and say racist and big, bigoted things, which is a subtle 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 di 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 difference. Um, I mean, I, I've lived all over all over this country because of my my dad's career, and one cons con one con constant has been those you know racist bigoted attitudes or actions uh, and that's from the general public and it's been from some some police agencies as well i mean i i i i still still get stops every now 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 and then when i'm in in my my private car i still get followed fall followed around in in the department 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 stores you know they still see all that stuff but you know you don't see that from apd you just don't they're good people they know what they know what's right they do it it's a good police agency they do it right uh you know and i think that there are some some groups that are around or out, out there as I said they're railing against against a a, 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 a PD. and in my mind they're they're they have uh, solu solu solutions that are looking for a problem problem right APD is not the problem problem uh, and knee jerk re reactions to serious 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 issues are not is not the way to go it needs to be thought 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 thoughtful it needs to be re 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 reason. And again, I mean, I do, I just want to want to say that you know these. This is a good good police agency. Defund fund funding or those type types of draconian measures are not the way to go. We need we need we need we need to support support them. We need uh, support support the you know what what they're trying trying to do. Their their initiative initiatives. Because they're good for this community, they're watching out for this community. They're watching out for all, all of us. And I said earlier today in the meeting, I'll, I'll be damned if I'm going to stand stand by and allow some 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 folks to try to tear down a group of really great individuals. So uh, thank you, thank you. That's all. That's all. That's that's all I have. Well, Chief Nelson, thank you very much. I appreciate your um, contribution, uh, both um, as your experience as uh, our fire chief and your personal experience and personal comments. So thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of um, counselors now I'm going to recognize uh, and uh, then we'll take stock of where we are. Um, I want to um, remind attendees that um, last night was a time for public hearing and we really valued hearing from the uh, community and will value hearing from public comment later in the agenda. But um, this was um, now the committee has to begin to do its thinking and um, this is kind of a first step and a very important step to take after this is the first step after the hearing. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Dorothy Pam, who's been very patient. Thank you, Dorothy, for being patient. Okay. Well, it's it's really hard to speak after that eloquent, the eloquent remarks of Chief Nelson, but um, I have a couple of comments here. Accepting the fact and I totally do believe this, that the Amherst Police Department, uh, the answers that we've received at many, many meetings are not doing the things which have brought up the uproar through the country um, in terms of weapons, in terms of physical force. I'm thinking that there might be some small thing they could do at this time. Um, restructure some of the follow-up calls that now you, they said they work with people from the other agencies, but using common sense and in consultation with people, some of those calls need not be made with a police officer. And could some of those follow-up calls be made by one of the public health professionals with whom that they're working? 
um, and perhaps we would you know be able to hire another one um, because so much of this has to do with um, the feeling of of being policed and it sounds like some of these calls, they have to make them. They're required to make them. They're legally required. It is good for the people that the calls are made. I understand that that's really important, but we, I don't think we can just ignore the fact that the feeling of being policed is real, even if there's actually a very good reason for everything that the police department is doing. We also have to acknowledge that if there are more people in an area, such as larger housing developments, they're gonna be more police calls. When he mentioned the, the case from Wildwood Lane, there aren't very many people down there, okay? But some places, it's going, they're going to, there's going to be more police presence because there are more people and people have different problems. But I want to go back to the call that was the, the ones that uh, Captain Ting was mentioning because I got confused in the terminology uh, with the Colonial Village. Uh, the word officer-initiated responses it sounded to me like the 80 calls were not made by the police department deciding I'll go visit these people, but that people called in for something. So I, I think that maybe, maybe I was confused with the terms, but some, all those various things, which are just the things that happen with people, um, sounded to me that, that probably somebody called the police department to come and then the, if an officer decides to do or has to do follow-up, then that might be an officer-initiated response. So I think Lynn was a little confused with some of the terminology there too. So I, I would really like to have some clarification on, on um, which calls were initiated by the public calling in saying, I've got a problem, I need some help, or which in fact were initiated by the, the police department on their own, which means nobody called. Sure. Yeah, understood, Dorothy, and thanks for that. So, and, and I'll ask Captain Ting to respond as well. But so, you know, the point of his original um, explanation was almost all of either officer follow up or officer initiated calls are the result of a call for police services okay. the day before, a week before, or a month before. It can be any combination of both. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Bill Laramie, I think everybody's familiar with Bill, you know. He may do a follow-up on a noise disturbance, but what he's been doing up at Grant Wood Drive, there's been a lot of officer-initiated things. So right. we can certainly try and find a better explanation for characterizing those calls for sure, because I don't want there to be confusion. But mm -hmm. with the community-based policing model that we use, officers are expected to do both. So there are times when it's going to be a officer initiated call when it might be a long-term type of thing he's working on or it might be something as something as bill stopping by the very next morning for a loud noise response that the officers went to and he wants to speak to these kids when they're sober and say hey look your mm -hmm. behavior is unacceptable that would be follow-up so okay. that's probably something we're going to need to work on as an agency about clarifying mm -hmm. what officer does um, with those types of calls but uh, I think the important thing is, is we don't just randomly drive around neighborhoods looking for people to pester. Okay. Um, it's, it's the result of calls that we've responded to. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, somebody had their hand up and then uh, took it down again. So I'm assuming that that was a purposeful decision. And I don't see any more hands from the council. So I'm going to take just a moment to see if anybody else from the council would like to uh, say anything, and if not, um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Bachman, did you have any concluding comments uh, before we move, uh, thank the police officers and move on to the next agenda section? Yeah, just a, just a few things, um, Andy. So I just want to make sure that people who are on this call and are recognized, so we've listened to them. Um, the chief and his staff were on the on the meeting last night and listened to the, the full public hearing. So, and I think we understand people are coming at this from a place of real concern and um, anger at, at what's happening at a national level. I think that um, the way I've thought about this is um, it's how Chief Nelson said, it's how we do policing. And I think that's something we want to engage in that conversation. I think that that's something that we are very interested in it. And I think there's a second piece of it, which is sort of systemic change. And I think that's something that we're also 
interested in, in looking at, but they're two different things. And I think that we, we are, have to focus on both of them at the same time. Um, I think, you know, we can talk philosophically about how change happens, um, but ultimately as a town council um, and town manager, we're responsible for the public health and public safety of our community. And that's why I put in a budget that I think meets the needs of the community. And I would encourage the council to move forward with that budget because I think cutting the budget of the public health or public safety uh, departments at this moment in time during the middle of a pandemic would just be a big mistake. So um, again, that doesn't mean that uh, the folks who have been communicating very um, uh, with, with great passion and very, very articulate concerns haven't been heard. It means that we have to have that conversation but it just, and it moves in a different way. Thank you. So I'm looking one last time to see if there's anybody else from the council or the committee who wishes to speak. Uh, Darcy, hi. Please unmute and join us. Darcy? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Darcy. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that um, it would be, it looks like there are 12 people that want to make public comments and um, that this is a, this is an area where we are saying that we really want to listen to and hear people. So I guess I'm just, I would just suggest that we allow people to speak for three minutes um, instead of two because, because we want to hear what they have to say, uh, knowing full well that most people aren't going to have three minutes worth of, um, of comment. So I'm just strongly suggesting that we allow people to speak and be heard. Um. Thank you for the comment. Uh, Sean Mangano, uh, you know who is here from the general government section that uh, was expecting to make presentations on the general government section of the budget, which is what the meeting was originally posted to be. So uh, uh, how many people are here from general government right uh, now? I think we have six or seven, um, maybe eight people um, here for the general government section. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that the problem that we have, and I'll, I'll look to other members of the committee to um, jump in if they have any um, contribution on this so that it isn't solely my um, decision on this. Uh, we originally had this scheduled as the meeting to hear about the general government departments, sections of the budget. And uh, we started an hour earlier in order to um, have the police be able to respond to questions that we had posed to the police department. And those questions were posed prior to last night's hearing. Um, so I think that we sort of have to decide on how we want to balance our time and respect um, our um, employees who want to be able to answer questions about their portions to the budget. Are there other members of the Finance Committee who um, want to contribute to what they think we should do here? So uh, no one's stepping forward. I think that we have two choices. Pat has her hand up. Has her hand up. Okay. Uh, Pat and. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, thank uh, the members of the police department who are here uh, for the work that you do. Um, I, I would like to hear some public comment, but only if people who spoke last night are not, there are people on that list who haven't spoken and I don't know whether we could sort through them or not, but I would be willing and uh, I'd be willing to listen. Um, 
to some of those comments, but I'm not sure how you sort them. But I think if people have spoken last night, that we know what they're going to say today. And I don't mean that disrespectfully at all. Um, any other comments, uh, Mandy? I know I'm not on finance, um, but I do think out of respect for our um, town staff who are sitting in a meeting and not able to do their work until we get to them and ask them their questions, we should, given that the agenda had public comment on last, um, respect their time and at least maybe even if all of that conversation can't be completed, maybe at least the presentation portion of general government and any direct questions to staff can be so that they can get on with their day and get their jobs done. Okay, that's kind of my inclination too. And so speaking to members of the public, um, we certainly do uh, plan to have public comment. Um, and if you need other, if there are other things that you need to do um, and you don't um, want to hear about the general government sections of the budget, um, why don't we, um, uh, you, you certainly can leave the meeting and come back on. Um, it will be probably about 45 minutes or so before, um, at least 45 and probably not more than 60. So I'd say if you leave the meeting, uh, please come back um, in 45 minutes so that we can, when we get to public comment, we can do so. But um, I think I will follow through and turn it back to Mr. Mangano, who's going to um, indicate to us the order in which we're going to go through the um, general government sections and make any, he or the, uh, the town manager might make introductory uh, comments about the general government section. And for everybody's reminder, the budget is available in full on the town website under um, the government tab and then budgets. And then you'll find um, the town manager's budget in the what's called the post COVID section. Um, Sean? So I think we were just gonna go right through the, the general government section, um, except for the facilities because you heard that um, at the previous meeting. So that would be Mr. Bockelman first, and then finance, and then we'll just keep going through the through the list. Um, and the, depart the department heads that are here will speak to each section. Okay. Um, so uh, the general government section of the budget begins, I believe, um, around page 20, roughly. Um, that's certainly where the, uh, our 19 is where the um, town manager section and the town council section is before. So why don't I start with uh, the town manager? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andy. So the town manager budget shows an increase of 21.5%. That's, that's an increase mainly because of a reallocation of two positions. One is the position of clerk of the council who is 75% under the town council's budget and 25% under the town manager's budget. Um, that position hadn't been budgeted to before previously. So that's, that's now plugged into the budget. Uh, the other is the um, uh, reallocation of the communications officer position, which had previously been in the IT department budget and it's more appropriately in the town manager's budget for 75% of the time, 25% of time still in town managers in the um, um, IT department. We've removed in terms of um, expenses, we removed uh, travel from the, the operating budget because there's, there, are no, there are not gonna be conferences and we're not gonna be going to conferences this year, I don't think. Um, so that's that's the summary of our budget. Okay, Lynn. Thanks. Um, I will note that we did not remove it under town council. However, I think we can assume that we are going to be see, seeing a um, change in that. In that, there will probably not be a physical mass municipal association meeting this year. Uh, and we may also have counselors that just choose not to go. 
Um, and so uh, we may find that as we get closer to January, the line of operating expenses, um, which I believe includes MMA, um, will not be as great. It still includes things like minute takers for council meetings. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to say that it would be completely gone. Okay. Uh, did you have any uh, anything else you wanted to ask about the first two sections of the budget? Are you talking to me, Andy? Yes. Since you were I the one submitted a list of about 25 questions, and they have since been answered in um, a document that Sean and um, others have prepared, particularly um, Sonia, and um, I'm perfectly satisfied with those and to the extent that they need to be discussed, uh, that's great. Uh, and you can see the questions that I asked because this is the section that I have to write up. So I have, you know, I kind of stated my case of questions and uh, people should go ahead with their presentations. Yeah, Andy, I'll just add that the, um, the questions on general government are posted on the Finance Committee page in the, the packet section um, for today's meeting. So if anybody wants to go and look at those questions and the, um, the responses that were provided, um, they're available there. Okay, and for anybody who can't find that, um, it actually is very easy to find. Just go to um, the town website uh government uh then the town council section and under the town council section is committees and then uh the finance committee and under finance committee you'll find packets in the packet for today's meeting so that's all um the the questions and the answers have been posted there and are available to anybody who seeks to go look for them um, I, I also want to say thank you for all the time that it took to answer those questions. And Paul, I know you jumped in on the human resources side to let us know what training looks like and so forth. I think it did help elaborate on the budget document. And Sean, I look forward to how we can look to look at ways to tweak the budget in the future. Okay. Looking at the uh, hands up, Kathy, do you have questions either about the town council or town manager section? Um, I well, I have a question that is cross cutting. So it starts, I'm just looking at the pages. I had a question about why something was done in the budget book um, on legal services. So I can bring it up later just to ask for the rationale. And um, so it was removed as a line item and put within another group. So we'll lose the trend. So that was, you know, I'm assuming it's a town manager decision because you control the legal budget. So um, I'm not sure where it got grouped before, but it's gotten grouped now that it's no longer a line item. And then I had a, um, just a cross cutting one so we can come back to it. Um, if we want internal staff, so staff that work for you or in general government to do studies where there's data available. So we had a fire EMS staffing question on the old staffing report, updating it, um, parking fees, parking policies, um, different design of North Commons. D is there a team that's in your office and other general government offices that can come together and do something on staff time. So th those were my two questions that didn't seem to fit specific to other categories. Okay, Paul. Sure, so Sonia will address the legal question, I believe. So on the second one, yes, I am your staff person. So when you have a question, that's my job under the charter. And um, that's, I mean, I devote a lot of time to helping you find the answers that you want. and so. I ask you to fund, I've asked why we've always funneled things through the town manager's office because my responsibility is the staff who are hired uh, under the town. And if there are questions and things that the council wants to ask and wants to pursue, those are things that we'll, we will assemble the, the appropriate people. That's our job to serve you like that. Okay. Sonia, did you want to address the legal thing? Yeah, um, that was just our attempt to kind of streamline the budget book a little. We had like two or three pages dedicated to legal that really said nothing. 
So we just put it under general services right along with the audit and uh, property and casualty insurance and stuff. But I see your point and I think in next year's budget, we can just create another line in the general services budget that shows you what's expended in history. Okay, because it was just, we lose the trend if it yes. just- I understand that now. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. Just purely that. Now, at first I thought we didn't need any legal services next year until <laughs> nice. so, I found it in the other budget. Yeah. So we were trying to be efficient, but realized it took away the detail that's important for everybody to see. So we will fix that next year. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we go on to finance? Sean, I guess you might be on for that. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna speak on behalf of a few different units. Um, the, the overall finance department is comprised of accounting, treasury, collection, and assessing. And all of those department heads are here today. We have uh, Cheryl Boucher, Boucher, Boucher good. Um, Jen LaFountain, Liz Duffy, and someone that not many people know, Sonia Aldrich, our controller. And um, so they're available to answer any questions, but I'm gonna do a brief overview of the budget and then just talk about some of the projects and goals that we're working on this year. Um, before I get into that too much, I, I did want to acknowledge all the staff um, that I just mentioned and also some of the staff that they supervise um, they all worked pretty much straight through the pandemic um, when people were staying at home. They, they came in to really keep up the operations running here at town, um, and they did a great job keeping things going. And they continue to, with the, their staff, help support different areas of the town. Um, we have some employees, um, whether it's parking or the front counter, who their jobs have changed because there's, that work is no longer really going on. And so they've shifted to help other areas of the town like Puffer's Pond or, or Cherry Hill. Um, and staff have been super flexible and, and we really appreciate their, um, their ability to adapt and go with the flow on things. Um, in terms of things that we're working on, so Lynn alluded to this a little bit, one of our goals for this year is to update the budget document. And we wanna get your input um, on things that you'd like to see and, and ways we can make it more useful um, to everybody. Um, and all these goals I'm going to mention, they're all team goals. They're, they're things that either cross departments within finance or they're, they cross departments within, within the town as a, as a whole. So um, we're going to review our uh, finance policies. So the, the document on the website was last put together in 2012, um, which was pre-charter change. So we're going to look at those uh, finance policies, make sure they're up to date, see if we want to add anything to them. Um, and obviously we'll share that all with you. We're going to update our OPEB funding plan, which Mr. Hegder uh, made sure that I explain what OPEB is. So other post-employment benefits, which is essentially health insurance obligations for retirees. Um, there's been a couple changes to the, the funding plan. One, our obligation every year is um, valued by an actuary. And there were some changes that were pretty significant last year. And also the contribution that we made in this year's budget, we reduced uh, in half. So it's going to be important to look at that funding plan, come up with a strategy for the next five to 10 years, and also take a long view as to how much longer till we fund it. Um, we are looking to streamline our benefits process. We've, we've collaborated between HR and payroll for many years. Um, it's worked out fine, but there's ways we can improve that. And so that's one area we'll be looking to make some uh, improvements. We're going to continue to expand online payments. We did a lot during the pandemic and put a lot of things online. Um, but there's even more we can do, especially with the new software that's in the planning department around permitting and rental registration. There's a lot more we can move online and make it even easier for people to, to pay bills or, or purchase services from the town. We're going to do a um, comprehensive review of fees. There, there's some fees in town that haven't been uh, looked at or, or maybe they have been looked at, but they just haven't changed in a long time. So we're going to review all the fees. There's hundreds of fees. Um, much more than on the school side. When I looked at it, I got a little nervous. At schools, we had like 12 fees. Um, and we're going to look at those. We're going to compare it to our neighbors and um, come back with maybe some recommendations around what our fees look like if they're at the right level. We're going to, uh, obviously, one of the big things for the town is to continue to support the capital improvement program. And there's some uh, data that's requested per the charter and also working with the council. We want to put together a complete a packet of information every year for all of you. And so that's gonna be a major goal this year is to get that all together. And a couple, two more. Um, sustainability has been a huge initiative of the town. We wanna, and the finance teams really helped support that initiative. Um, 
come up, brainstorm, identify potential funding strategies that we can, uh, maybe they're not good ones, maybe they're bad ones, uh, but we want to throw out different ideas that the town council and the finance committee um, and others can consider and help us move closer to that goal. And then the last one's an easy one, we wanna update our website and make it much more user friendly, keep the information as accurate as possible and as up to date as possible um, and make it easier to access information. And so the last thing I'll just point out is uh, the finance budget is going down 8.2%. That's because a couple of the uh, budget reductions in this year's budget were in finance. There was a half time budget analyst position that was reduced and there was a half time position in the assessor's office um, that supports the assessor that was reduced. And so um, it's gonna definitely put more stress on the department. We um, are confident that we can work collaboratively within our own teams um, to cover the, everything that needs to be covered, uh, but it will require us to collaborate even more than we have in the past and, and we're up for that challenge. Um, and that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions and we also have all the, the specific department heads here that can answer questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the one question I have did you just indicate that you're looking at uh, the financial policies themselves and yes. whether there are any revisions? So there's a, on the finance page, there's a, there's been policies that were posted. I think they were created um, by Sandy Pooler in conjunction with Sonia and other department heads. I'm sure Sherry and Jen helped work on it. Um, it includes the town's investment policy. Um, it's where the, the guidelines around reserve levels comes from. And so that, that, policy manual is dated 2012 and it's um, something we want to make sure is still up to date, see if there's any references to town meeting or anything like that. Um, and also see if there's anything else we think should be in there. Okay. Um, the reason I bring it, that I, that's the financial, financial policies and objectives, I believe it's. The I think so. Yep. And uh, being a, a member of the finance committee that developed those, um, the history of that was, was actually developed by the original by the old finance committee, which was a committee of the town meeting. Mm -hmm. And it was designated as a role of the finance committee. And it was done while um, John Musanti was finance director, was the original development, though it was amended when Mr. Pooler was the finance director. Uh, I think that it is now um, a policy that belongs to the council and so um, I, we will have to um, get a decision as to how the council will handle it, but I assume the council will work for, through the finance committee to make recommendations on proposed changes, and then the changes uh, would probably have to go to the council. Okay, yeah, that's something we will um, definitely work with uh, the proper channels on. Yeah, I, Lynn, I don't know if you had anything to add to that or... Um, no, I, I frankly thank you for that history as well. I frankly didn't know that, but my question financial policies is if they have they, any implications for things the council needs to do or approve or look at. I don't think there'll be implications for bylaws, but we have asked other committees who have alluded to, or other departments who have alluded to doing things that might lead to changes in bylaws to give us plenty of heads up on that. Um, the um, other, um, along with this though, I, in the same manner, um, I don't know, honestly, what the council's relationship or responsibility is with regard to setting fees, but even if we don't have to approve them, I'm sure we would like to know about the changes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and the okay. uh, only other comment is it's a very, very, very ambitious set of goals. I wish... Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all projects. I'm not saying they're all, they'll all be done necessarily, but we have a, a really talented team here um, and we want to make progress on all of them. I, I appreciate them. I just, if you have a few ongoings in the budget book next year, that's okay by me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we call some members of the committee and the council. Uh, Bob Hegner. Hey, thanks. Um, I, I, I have three questions. Um, on page 23, the last long range of objective is to establish property values of all UMass real estate. 
And I'm wondering why the town is involved with that and whether we're getting reimbursed for our, our effort. And then I have two questions on parking. One is that on page 25, the parking ticket correct collection rate is significantly lower than like the property tax uh, collection rate. And is that due to out of state cars and things like that, people basically just ignoring the ticket? Um, and then uh, I noticed also in 18 and 19 parking permits that were issued increased about 10, 12% per year. And I'm wondering if that trend is continuing and at what point that becomes a, you know, we start running out of spaces. So thanks. So why don't we start with your first question and I'll turn it over to Liz to talk about the, um, the UMass properties and, and how that's going. Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me today. Um, basically what we're looking at is just as a rule, uh, look at the properties that we receive pilots back from to make sure that we haven't overlooked um, any, any options to increase our pilot. Um, and, you know, it hasn't really been fully looked at from an appraisal standpoint. I do apologize for the phone. I have no idea how to silence it. Um, but anyway, I think you get the point. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the state has a formula and right now we are not getting as much from the UMass pilot as our neighboring town. And I did look into it further and the formula doesn't seem to make sense, but we have to have a good case to actually question it. But if there's any other questions, I'm here to answer it. No, no thanks, that's very helpful. And Bob, we'll get back to you on the parking questions. We're going to dig into those a little more. Um, the first question was, why is our collection rate uh, lower, right, for, uh, for parking tickets and lower than what we get for property taxes? Well, can you restate your second question again? It was about the parking permits issued by the town. If you look on page 25, the number goes up about 10 or 12 percent uh, from uh, 17 to 18 and from 18 to 19 e each year. Okay. And it's just a question of whether that's a trend and whether that's going to put pressure on downtown parking. Okay. Yeah, we'll dig into those numbers a little bit and we'll get you, uh, we'll send it out to the whole group. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that Mandy was next. Um, Bob actually asked one of my questions um, with the review of the property values for UMass. Um, I think. Uh, you answered this um, with that though. We get pilots from the state under a state formula, as you said, if we increase the valuations, if, if redoing these review of property values increases those, evalu those valuations, will the state reimbursement um, automatically increase because of how the state figures it out? And then would we also have an additional ability to negotiate that separate one under the strategic apart partnership agreement. So I was just trying to figure out how the review of those valuations might affect revenue coming into town for state owned land through the state appropriation, not a strategic partnership. And then the other one was, um, I noticed we're still issuing payroll checks in paper. And many employers have moved to requiring EFTs for payroll. And I was wondering why we haven't done that yet, because I presume that would save money. So I'll answer the, the second one really quickly, Liz, and then if you want to just talk a little bit about how that formula for UMass properties um, is put together. Um, as a Accounting background, we definitely want to move towards all direct deposits. It does make things easier, um, less time stuffing checks. Um, you don't have to worry about checks getting lost, all those types of things. Um, we haven't yet made it a requirement, um, but it is something that we can consider. And I just know that a lot of times there are some people that make an argument why they, they don't want that going directly into their bank account. Um, they, they like a physical check each week. Um, yeah, but we do, we are seeing more and more move towards direct deposits and, and we always try to encourage it whenever new people come on. Holly, correct me if I'm wrong here, Holly, but I think all new employees are automatically put on direct deposit. It's basically um, the people that have art that were here before. You're muted, Holly. Yes, that is correct. Um, there are 
was some bargaining unit, um, bargaining agreement changes that require all new employees to have direct deposit, but there are some older employees who have been around for many years who are grandfathered and are still getting um, paper checks, as well as part-time hourly people. We encourage, we highly encourage them to get direct deposit, but there are a few who are still taking paper checks. Okay. And anything else? If not, um, Liz, do you want to weigh in on that UMass question real quickly? Yeah, um, I'd be glad to. Um, basically, the way that the formula works doesn't seems a bit archaic. Um, I think in the time that they they developed this formula, um, perhaps it made sense at the time, but it's time to have it revisited. Yeah, and if I can just jump in on that, this is just to give us um, ammunition and knowledge so we can take it to the state to say, you need to revisit the formula. Right now, Hadley gets more money than the town of Amherst has, and it's based on sheer acreage the way we understand it. It's not based on any improvement to the buildings. So which is, it, it doesn't it address the impact on the community on what is on that acreage. It just looks at the acreage. So, so that's something we should be lobbying our state rep and senators and all for as we get that information? When we're ready, yes. yeah. Okay. Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on this because it had come up. Um, so I want to ask, are we also, do we also already have the valuation of Amherst College? Because one of the things that has been helpful in some communities, Paul, when you talked about negotiations, um, there have been proposals that uh, suppose we looked at only 20% of the value, um, what would the payment be? Smith, Nor the Northampton mayor used that with Smith College to get their contribution rate up. Burlington used it with the University of Vermont to get their, so it was an ability to have a valuation of how many millions and what is being paid compared to property. And UMass has always been, uh, there was no number to even look at it. So I think it's a, uh, you know, if we can get money because of the formulas fixed, whatever imbalance it is, but it's been a, you know, what does UMass Lowell pay? What does UMass whatever? We haven't had that base um, and it requires doing this kind of uh, valuation. So I'm thrilled to see this as, as an effort. Um, so it's not just someone making a guesstimate. Thank you. Dorothy. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the parking permits, and um, I'm going to just mention some complaints that I've received in relationship to them. Uh, the parking permits increased, at least most people think, because of the building of two new downtown apartment buildings, which did not include sufficient parking, and. Um, so some people were not happy with the fact that out of cars with out of state licenses were taking the space in front of their house all the time. But the main thing I would say that we as the finance committee would think about is the fees that are getting paid are very, very low. It's almost like a, um, a benefit you're giving somebody. I mean, was it 25 a year or something? So if you're going to sell the plots on, on neighborhood streets to um, people to park on, I think the town should at least make some money. And that's, you know, just a quick follow up. That's one of the reasons why we're going to look at all of our fees this year. Um, and again, we'll compare to what Northampton does and what other cities do um, on that front. Okay, good. Um, anything else? Uh, yeah, because the only other thing that I had thought about, and I don't want to get into a very long thing on this because we want to do today, but Liz, uh, you're also the one who's, uh, responsible for looking at our new growth estimates and uh, our and new growth, of course, figures into what our participation is in any, um, and you were looking at uh, the, the projection for next year is almost a 50% cut, which I assume is due to um, what you're looking at for activity for next year due to what's happened with the economy because of COVID. Um, do you have any sense at this point um, going out whether that's um, 
lower level as something we should be assuming into the future for the next couple of years? It's hard to say. Most folks that I am talking to in the, in the know are on a wait and see kind of situation. Um, the drivers for this community are obviously the colleges and the actions that colleges take have a direct impact on your financial uh, for all your, your feeding businesses. Um, so unfortunately, um, it is a kind of wait and see kind of situation to see what your colleges are going to do and how it's going to impact your financials. Because basically what I'm hearing from the commercial population is you have a number of people that are saying, hey, let's, re let's re re renegotiate my rent or I can't make my rent, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna fold up shop, I can't make it through this time. Um, but you also have a good contingency of people that have been looking for that opportunity to get in on the Amherst market. So, got a lot of things playing a role. We'll really have a wait and see. We, have two, we have two buildings that the uh, town council has spent a lot of time looking at, one on uh, Southeast Street and the other one on, uh, uh, I guess it's University Drive Extension South. Um, are those assumed into the 21 additions to uh, new growth? Yes, yes, those will be new growth for 21, I believe. And, and we have some new growth for 20, because remember, um, we do do with the percentage complete as of June. So we um, have some of those buildings that are partially finished, including 26 Spring Street and uh, is it 408 North Hampton Road, the uh, Aspen Heights? We have uh, um, quite a few new um, improvements that have been going up around the community. Not to mention, since folks have been home, they're putting a lot of decks, pools, additions, and so forth on their existing homes. Um, and as far as the resale on your homes, um, has not really moved too much. You've seen some people that said, oh, you know, if this is too uncertain, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna take my, my property off the market and wait, which reduced the inventory even more than it was already reduced. So the supply and demand here is still fairly good. Um, but I think it's our commercial industrial properties that um, you know, we really have more of a wait and see. And not so much in the industrial, but obviously in the apartments that fall under our, believe it or not, our residential, even though they're multiple units. Um, they fall under our residential um, category, which is new for me, because usually we would consider those uh, commercial over four units. Um, but in the state of Massachusetts, it's considered residential. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's helpful. Uh, Kathy, and then uh, we'll move on to human rights and human resources. It, just a quick follow-up on Andy's. Um, I, I asked this last year, um, but I just wanted to try to understand it better. Up by us, I'm in North Amherst, we have a huge complex that was already new growth, it's, it, but it's been opening. If all of the commercial part of it, all the square footage remains empty, um, does that change your calculation on what the tax rate is on it, or does it not change until they lower the rent, rent vet, you know, it's, it's, it's sitting there waiting for somebody to say, I want to be in there, but so far it's empty. And I think one of the big buildings that's just about to open up isn't full either. So what happens if people misjudge the market and they open and the apartments aren't full? If the rents start coming down, does that change what we tax them at? It is based on a lot of factors. Um, when a building is incomplete, we tend to lean more towards the cost approach. When it becomes um, occupied, fully occupied, or what we call a stabilized rent situation, then we lean more towards the income approach to value. But saying that um, you do have to have uh, a certain amount of logic going into it when considering the value vacancy, especially on environmental impact. That would just be ignorant for me to dissuade that from the, the calculation. Um, however, you know, it's kind of on the same situation with your own home. 
you may have had four kids grow when you had a, a large family there, but you still have three bedrooms in your home, but you don't have four kids occupying those three bedrooms. There's still value in the home as a three bedroom home, um, just as there is still value in an apartment complex that may have um, you know, more than 20% vacancy or 30% vacancy. Um, so there is, it's a weighing, it's, it's kind of too complicated to give you in a short conversation. Okay. Um, but I'd be glad to give you something more in depth if you want to reach out. Okay. I'll, I will though. I'll follow up. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I'd be glad to. Andy, can I say something? Yes. I wanted to acknowledge Holly Bowser. Um, who's here. I wanted everyone to know that she plays a huge role in our budget. Hi, Holly. She took on a whole lot of, um, she took on the budget, the halftime budget position that we just eliminated. She took on most of those duties and without her, I would not have survived the last four years. So, and I love her purple hair. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. Holly, thank you for all you do and thank you for saving Sonia's sanity. I don't know if she did that, but she helped a lot. No, she did. She definitely did. I thank you very much, Sonia. I think some days I make her more insane, but there are also days that I do save it. Uh, Sean, should we turn on to human rights and uh, human resources? So, um, Paul, I don't know if you want to say a few things for this section. We obviously have a, um, a vacancy there. Um, sure. So this is this is a basic budget. Uh, it, it calls for a human rights director, human resources director, and uh, human resources uh, manager. Uh, we have placed the human rights uh, position in this position, uh, but when we we are prepared to take funds to allocate it uh, for human rights complaints to a um, outside person, if we need to do that at this point in time. Right now, for human rights, Jen Moyston is coordinating the human rights commission's work. I'm doing a tremendous job at that, honestly. And that's the 0.5%, the 0.5 position that you see in there. That's Jen Moyston's position. Any questions? Lynn? Yeah. Paul, would you just explain what you just said? <laughs> I'll try to say it again in English. Um, so we have a human resources. I, I, these two, the human resources and human rights, they're both HR, they get confusing for people. So I'm going to talk about one first. The human resources position is the director of human resources. There's a human resources manager. And those are the two positions that run our um, human resources operations, everything from our trainings to our recruitment, to handling uh, collective bargaining grievances, all things like that. Um, in addition, at one point in time, the human resources director was placed in that position when Deb Bradway had that position and took on those additional duties of human rights director. Uh, there weren't a lot of demands on that other than s supporting the Human Rights Commission. Um, and with Evelyn's departure, Jen Moyston, uh, with actually Evelyn's uh, support, has taken on more of a responsibility on, for the human rights piece and has really um, actually brought that to a whole new level, I think, than anybody had anticipated. So, um, you know, providing a lot of direction actually to the Human Rights Commission and taking a real leadership role with that group. Thank you. And uh, is it, do you have any sense as to how long the position might be vacant for Human uh, Resources Director? So human resources, we have advertised. Uh, we have, oh, I haven't checked lately. We had, last time I looked, we had 26 applications, some very good ones. Um, We're um, setting up a team to um, do the interviews, review the applications, do the interviews, and hopefully get that done as soon as we can. We have two major uh, recruiting uh, uh, efforts going on right now, human resources director and health director. And they're on a parallel path. Yeah, and unfortunately, they were both working um, very much on the COVID-19 and uh, with the Human Resources Director working on policies and practices for our own staff. Uh, um, have we been hampered in our uh, COVID-19 responses with all of this? Well, obviously, the position is needed. Uh, we had a reopening committee. We had a committee that was set up that included 
people from IT and um, human resources and planning and uh, treasurer's office, uh, collector's office, um, who are all participating. Um, so there is support there, but um, in terms of the day-to-day -day management, um, it's we're a little bit um, hampered, but our human right resources manager has been here for a while. And so she's been stepping up and she's the acting human resources director right now. And is not a candidate for the position. And Dorothy, do you have a question? I, I just wanted to make an obvious comment that it's really too bad. And I understand it was really beyond our control that the human rights, human resources, and health are, first of all, such small departments in the first place. I mean, these are areas which I believe the people have been saying they feel they should be increased. And I just want to make the statement that I hope in next year's budget, we have more resources devoted in this area. That's it. Thank you. Uh, but as we all know, getting more resources is a challenge with all the different areas where we want to put new resources, but that's a, a discussion to come, but thank you. Uh, if there's nothing else, we should turn on uh, to employee benefits uh, to keep this moving. Yeah, I can speak to this one briefly. Um, so this is primarily health insurance, but it also has some of the other insurances. Um, Sonia, feel free to correct me if I misstate anything. Um, so most of you know this, but we are now with Maya, we're no longer self-insured. So, um, we know what our premium is for the year. Um, we have a projected decrease in health insurance, which is a combination of rates coming in lower than expected and also our enrollment. Um, but this is also where we added funds, um, to fill some gaps in our insurance coverage where we were self-insured. Um, one of the ads that was highlighted during the presentation last night, um, that that's the section here where the you'll, where that can be found. Um, and I think if there's any questions uh, between Sonia, Paul, and I, we can we can answer them. Are there any questions, Bob? Uh, yeah, I I had two questions. The, the the first one is there's a note on page 31 that said that it says that Amherst, Amherst manages the health and life insurance plans for all employees of the regional school, schools, the elementary schools in the town of Pelham. And I'm wondering for the regional schools in Pelham, is there some sort of cost sharing with the other, the other towns? And then the amounts shown for health insurance, et cetera, on page 32, is that only the Amherst share or is that the total amount, including all of these employees that, that you know, of the regional schools, et cetera. Yeah, so, so I'll take a first crack at it, Sonia, and then if you wanna fill it out. Um, so in terms of the health insurance um, plans, so the schools do process their own health insurance and they do all their own balancing and everything. Really, I think that mostly relates to the checks get sent to the town and they eventually all get sent together to um, Maya. Um, the town does provide a little support in terms of reconciling if there's any issues, but um, most of that happens at the school level. Um, and then to this, the next page, that would be just the town share. It wouldn't be the combination. Um, so that would just be the cost to the town of health insurance and other insurance accounts. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I just want to, uh, on page 31 in that comment, it also means um, our IAC, we work with the IAC to manage all of our plans and stuff. So we do it for all of the entities since we were all self-insured together, so, yeah. Okay. Um, one question on this, uh, the way it's worded, it says towns of, uh, town of Pelham. Are we just doing the school employees of the town of Pelham? Or are we um, also providing insurance to other employees of the town of Pelham? Uh, the town of Pelham is also included. The, the regional schools actually do the payroll for the town of Pelham um, because it's so small. Um, and the, the number of employees with health insurance is very, uh, very few. So, so it does so, include the town. So the, but the assistance still comes from the region. Uh, okay, uh, Lynn, and then Kathy. So Lynn? Partially a question I asked, and I don't think I asked this thoroughly, and that is what were we self-insured on before? 
of the church. No, so um, Paul, do you want to weigh in on this one a little bit? It's around um, um, workers' compensation insurance and injured on duty. Yeah, so so we had been to health insurance, which was a major sign. That's the that's the last three years the work we had done to go to a fully insured program there, uh, and then we have workers' compensation and injured on duty, which is basically workers' compensation for police and firefighters and call firefighters who are injured on duty and. Uh, that was a giant liability that we had because if someone gets injured on duty, um, we would have to fund that. So purchasing insurance, I, I'm a big believer in buying insurance to limit our liability. So that was the biggest vulnerability I felt we had at this moment in time, especially when you en enter into a down economy, uh, you start to pay attention to that. So that was one of the coverages that we obtained. Okay, and that just that a whole different question that's actually not related necessarily to this section and that is are, in terms of our buildings and equipment are we self-insured or do we carry insurance we have insurance for that yeah thank you so uh kathy um did, were bob focused on page 32 on the costs if that is that just amherst is the head count on page 31 everybody You know, so so when I look at how many people have family or how many, um, or is that just, so that's my question. Uh, Holly, Holly or Sonia, do you know if that includes region and Pelham employees or is that just Amherst's uh, town and elementary? I think it's just town. I believe looking at those numbers that it would be everybody. Yeah. It would include all entities. Okay. I'll double check with Teresa. Yeah, we, we get the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a big issue, but it just lets you see how many people are out there with a Medicare SUP, um, you know, and that's also linking it to OPEB on things we're paying for. So I just think it's, it's useful. Yeah. And I the other thing, Kathy, I'll just say that you'll see in those numbers is when you see from FY17 to FY18, there was a pretty significant drop um, or realignment. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's when we switched to be uh, switched to Maya. We did a full re-enrollment and right. we saw the numbers change quite a bit. And do you, I guess, you know, on family versus individual, I, I don't actually like these policies, but they saved the town money. Um, do you encourage someone to not take family if their spouse has coverage um, so that you have a person with a, you know, where, where the kids and the spouse go or is it completely... Um, up to the employee. Um, some employers give an incentive um, to opt into the other employer. What people call it other people's money um, is another way of thinking about it. We don't, um, we don't like verbally encourage them, but there is an opt-out program um, where employees, if they want, if they have health insurance with us and they leave, leave to go to a spouse's plan, um, we, there's an incentive, a financial incentive they get every year for that. Um, and that was actually one of the things when we did the full re-enrollment with Maya, um, we saw many people take, take that incentive and it saved quite a bit of money for the town, or at least for the schools, I don't know about the town. Um, but I know that year we saw the school save a lot of money because of that opt-out program. Okay. You know, I, the, one, the one place I saw it work in reverse for the local public schools is Dartmouth University at one point had such a bad plan that all the Dartmouth employees tried to get on the local school system. You know, I mean, right. you know, people look at their benefit packages, but th thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, state that the numbers in the book is for the entire membership. Okay. All of them. The last bill was like 1532, right? Holy memberships. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sean Hannon uh, is here for information technology. Hi. Sean Hannon, the IT director. I'll run through uh, my stuff pretty quickly, I think. Um, so nothing too new or exciting in our budget. We have um, <clears throat> personnel changes. We have the um, communication manager, as Paul mentioned, was moved uh, three Three fourths of her was moved from IT to the town manager's budget, just to reflect the the nature of that position, the communication manager. Um, some of the big 
big accomplishments for the year. Um, we did a lot of cybersecurity training through a state grant that we received. Um, we started the implementation of our new um, application, um, our new uh, permit and license application software. Um, it basically takes every pretty much every license permit um, application that's received in um, across multiple departments, um, a lot in, in uh, conservation and development, but also um, down to the town clerk's office, the fire department, DPW, all those departments that'll support that. Um, we um, implemented a new application um, tracking software along with uh, the human rights department, human resources department, um, and they and IT received a state innovation award for that. Um, probably the biggest thing that was really boring to most um, users, but exciting to us is we performed a major server um, migration upgrade that we went from uh, from about six year old infrastructure to really fast um, new servers. They're um, all flash storage, which basically means they're, instead of a lot of spinning parts in them, they're all solid state. And really the, the big benefit to that is there, there are some things that happen within GIS that are little, literally a hundred times faster. Um, so that's pretty exciting. It's also um, it uses a lot less energy. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, the stuff that we have coming up that we've started working on for the upcoming slash current fiscal year, um, continuing the um, application software. Um, the next big thing is the rental permit applications, running that through the new system that will save a lot of uh, time and effort in the conservation development department. Um, We've got new fiber being installed under the um, previous Comcast contract. We had, um, we were receiving uh, service over the fiber INET that's going away this uh, calendar year. So we have we've signed a contract to have new fiber installed um, that's been ordered and it's, it's gonna be on its way to us and they're gonna put that up on the poles. Um, it's pretty exciting. We have a new GIS base map. So they did a flyover um, it's the imagery that you see in the GIS system, as well as the um, topographical information that's used across a bunch of departments. That happens every 10 years. Um, that's, um, that's been updated, being updated. But a ma major upgrade to our Munis financial system, moving that onto new virtual servers, um, upgrading that. And then uh, Wi-Fi upgrades uh, to start with indoor Wi-Fi upgrades. We, um, we, everybody trying to do Zoom calls now and the Wi-Fi, um, people moving around in buildings to find Wi-Fi where it works and it's not terrible. Um, so we're doing that um, indoor um, Wi-Fi within town buildings and then um, address the outdoor Wi-Fi after that. That's what I've got. Yeah, I see three people with questions. Uh, Dorothy, Lynn, and Kathy. So, uh, Dorothy. Okay. So this is to Sean. Uh, mm -hmm. After you get everything done in the town and everything is automated and upgraded, just so you don't feel there's nothing to do, I just <laughs> lay a marker for I think a future movement um, that I've been on my mind, which is I think maybe the town of Amherst is going to need to provide. Uh, Wi-Fi to the apartment complex, and that could be a major social justice um, movement thing. Um, I just thinking about how if you can't connect, then you can't really participate in any of this. So we we need a gift from the gods for that. I know, but I'm just saying that that might be something in the future. Yeah. Uh, Lynn. Actually, my uh, statement or question was very much along Dorothy's. And um, if this last, if this pandemic has taught us anything, and that is that we do need to make Wi Fi much more accessible to certain areas of town. Uh, I know when we first did the whole decision with this, I, with replacing the Comcast INET, 
we looked at that and said, no, we don't want to become a provider. Uh, but as we move through issues related to social justice, access to learning, and just general public access, I think we may need to revisit that and look for money to support it. Great. Yeah. Uh, being a former select board member who is on the negotiating team for the Comcast and Amherst media contracts, I think that we were just trying to figure out since Comcast was insisting that they were no longer going to provide the INET, uh, that we needed to do something. And we were just trying to figure out how we could pay for a fairly expensive operation to replace what we were not going to get in the next, uh, through the entire term of the next contract. Um, and Sean and Paul were also part of that negotiating team and Doug Slaughter. Um, so I think they can add anything that they might have to add to it. But anyway, I'll leave it at that. Kathy? I'm, I think we're building all on the same piece, the INET. Um, when you do the downtown area, how far does it extend to? And a question I have on how easy it is to add some pieces. For example, if and when, so I'm, let's say when, we build a new elementary school, could it extend, can it extend as far as Wildwood or Fort River? Can we do direct linkages or is that way beyond, I know it's way beyond downtown the way you've defined it. Um, so, so this notion of if you start someone, can you build pieces? And then the other piece is on the social justice um, side. I'm sure uh, energetic town people who are constantly looking for grants have looked to see whether there are any under that label out there. And I have no idea whether the Gates Foundation is doing any funding of this, but they have the kind of money that if they decided um, linking low-income communities when people, and as people probably know, Bill Gates gave a TED talk early on in pandemics before there was one, but he's been very active on these issues. I just have no idea, and it would have to be a very deep pocket big foundation, and the Gates Foundation is one of them that has focused in the past on um, fiber optics, computer systems, without promising that we will only buy Microsoft for the rest of our lives. But, you know, so I just, you know, just this notion of can we link up at least the people who otherwise wouldn't be linked or that makes sense because there are public buildings. Mm -hmm. So I can jump in on a little bit of that. So the school department, when they went virtual, did have an inventory of all the students and what their internet capacity was. They provided hotspots. They tried to work with Comcast to a certain extent and Verizon. They both came out with programs, but they're all, each one of them was a little bit funky in one way or another. Either you had to have credit, which a lot of folks didn't have, or things like that. They just had these sort of hoops that some folks just couldn't get through. And so, but we did, the district did buy a whole bunch of hotspots that people could activate uh, to access. So no one was left, they, they, their intention was that no one would be inhibited from connecting to school because of lack of internet access. But I think what you guys are talking about is a globe, more a, a larger scale um, approach, um, which would make in essence, the town become more of a, a competitor to Comcast. Um, and for that, that's a significant investment that would require a revenue source and whether we want to get into that field. We've talked about not getting to, into that field previously and then declined doing it because it's not something that we do. We're not in that business, but it's certainly something we can explore again. Um, so. Okay. And it's just, I know some of the small communities in Vermont have banded together to do fiber optics as a group because no one, for the same reason that, and they have a central manager um, and but it, it took uh, a team organizing to go town to town to town to town to, right. to get to a critical mass before they could then do anything. So I realize it's a much bigger project, but just trying to think of where we could build on at least some pieces we've started. It was a major effort of both uh, Shootsbury and Leverett that set up their own systems. And uh, 
This was something that took years and years of their work to get it going. Um, as far as the other quest parts of it, um, the uh, connectivity to elementary schools is already a part of the current INET, correct, Sean? Yeah, so the fiber install that we have going up will connect 23 sites, which include all the schools um, and actually includes uh, Groff Park now and Mill River um, Great. pool as well. So um, quickly, you know, Wi-Fi is great for a relatively small coverage area. Um, so if you want to cover a parking lot, um, if you want to cover the parking lot behind Town Hall, you want to cover a relatively small area like that, it's great. Um, it does not travel through trees and most buildings very well. So when you start looking at apartment buildings in order to provide coverage there, you really, you really need to get inside the building to provide ad adequate, adequate coverage. Um, it's not to say that it can't be done, but we have, um, we have some Wi-Fi on the Bangs um, roof and it covers um, it covers part of Ann Whalen, but only one side of um, Ann Whalen. Um, and so it kind of comes a problem because we, we don't cover the other side of Ann Whalen with that Wi-Fi from, from the Bangs Center roof. And I guess the other thing I would uh, point out to one of the questions of setting up our own system, um, we had the discussion once before, Sean, about the uh, difficulty of negotiating with the owners of the poles that we're trying to get our lines put up on would be uh, not uh, willing to give us the kind same rate that they're willing to give us as a town for a town-owned sy limited system if we were also selling um, services in competition to them. Correct. Yeah, so we're going... We're going on the poles in the municipal communication space, which is space that the select board got basically back, going back to when there were um, telegraph wires for fire alarms. It's been the the town has had the right to be up there, that part of the pole for essentially forever. Um, and we can do that because we're using it for um, municipal use. If we were to start offering paid service over that, then we would um, we would have to go back to the pole owners and we would have to get a license, a pole attachment license to be up there. Um, so it's not to say that it can't be done, but it's um, that part's involved. And then the other part, I, I believe on the financial side, essentially we'd have to create a municipal light plant, which is essentially a, a fancy enterprise fund. Um, and that's a multi-year process. So, and again, not to say that it can't be done. It's it's uh, it's not quick or simple. The technical part's easy, but so <laughs> there's nothing else. Then I think we should get on to Shavina and uh, Thanks. town clerks and elections. But Sean, thank you very much. Shavina, thank you. Her. So, welcome. When you can, can you unmute? Hello. Yes, <laughs> okay. Hello, thank you. It was a little bit of a delay on unmuting the mic. How are, how is everyone? Good. Hello. Thank you for having me. So I'm here just to discuss um, our budget, so both the town clerk and our election budget. Um, and so the town clerk, uh, a lot has been going on on both the town clerk and the election side. Um, when we initially began um, preparing the budget in the beginning of the year, we had a lot of um, objectives and goals. And thanks to COVID, some of those we've been able to accomplish. And so those are things that I wanted to highlight. First, I'd like to start by saying that um, I have an amazing staff who has been uh, resilient during the shutdown. They've been here. We've been in office throughout the shutdown. We began working a staggered shift. Um, so they would come in for half days and I would work opposite of 
to our debt with our assistance counselor um, so that we would have management coverage um, all day. So we were here every day so that um, business would be as usual as it could be and so that there would be no um, lapse in um, services provided to the community. We were able to process all of our dog licenses on time. We were able to still process all the registrations. We were still able to process <clears throat> vital records. And part of the reason we had to be in office is because we can process vital records and close those registrations. Those are state um, systems that we don't have access to remotely. And so we were able to still come in and get that work done. Um, and so it allowed us an opportunity to focus on some of those vital um, aspects of the town clerk's job. Um, while we were in shutdown, we were able to make progress. We partnered with IT and with our collective treasurer, and we were able to roll out online e-payment that went in effect on July 1st. So um, now we are able to accept um, dog license renewal and vital records requests online. Um, and so that's a great accomplishment. It was something that I remember, um, I originally had interviewed for the town clerk position in 2018 and Jen LaFountain was on the recruitment uh, team then. And that was a question that she asked me. So Jen, I remember that question. She asked me, do you all do uh, online dog licensing in the municipality that I came from? And so I told her, I said, if you, if I'm offered the will make it happen. And so we made it happen in 2020. Um, and so that's um, a, a great accomplishment that I am proud of. Now, some things that are changing without jumping ahead um, is in our elections side. Um, as maybe many of you know or you don't know, um, there's been an extensive amount of legislation that was put forth um, during the spring in response to COVID. Um, I was fortunate enough to work alongside um, state rep uh, Dome and uh, Senator Comerford to go over the legislation, offer feedback, and um, give some insight on what I felt would be beneficial or detrimental to the town clerk's department in regards to, to um, elections. And so um, the bills went into conference committee um, the last week of June and made it to the governor on last week, and so the bill was signed on last Monday. So we have a lot of work to do in a short amount of time. Um, and so I've been um, in conversation, Paul and I have been in conversation as well as Sean and I regarding how we're gonna move forward um, to respond with um, elections in this season and in this climate. Okay, questions. Mandy and um, let's start with you and then Mary Lou. Sure. Thank you. I have two questions. They're both related not to elections. Um, okay, and one is dog licenses. Um, yeah. Our enforcement of dog licenses sits in the police department. I'm curious why the issuance of them sits in the town's clerk's office instead of sort of at the public safety office, why is there that split between who enforces them and who issues them? Um, and then the other one was on page 37 of the budget book for the town clerk's office where you list your service levels. Um, mm -hmm. The conflict of interest law compliance service levels in FY18 mm -hmm. were 75 and in FY19 mm -hmm. were 584. And I just wanted to, uh, I, why is it so high? Um, is that something okay. that we started actually enforcing it or what, what happened? <laughs> so to answer your first question, so dog licenses by MGO are a, re are a responsibility of the town clerk. So that's why. And so we have um, the police enforce it um, for late fees. And because sometimes, you know, you need a little extra muscle to get $5. <laughs> um, and as far as the, um, the increase, on the conflict of interest. Um, all municipal employees, state and municipal employees have to do the conflict of interest every other year. And so for the town, um, it looks like it was in um, 2019. So the town does it in odd numbered years. 
So no one, only new employees would have done it in 2018 mm -hmm. versus in 2019. So in 2019, everyone had to go through conflict of interest training. And so we retain those records. So once you go through, it's an online training and you get your certificate, you have to submit it to the town clerk. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. Okay, uh, Mary Lou. Hey, this is an election question. Um, sure. With the university and colleges, um, some of them doing all online classes, some the combination. We know in a presidential election year that many of these students vote locally, register mm -hmm. locally. Is there any plan or thought about about that happening here in Amherst and how you'd handle that? Uh, and I, I do know a little bit about the um, plan that the legislature set up, but I guess how how are we dealing? How are we going to deal with that? Because it's clear that all these students will not be back as they have been oh. in the past during a, a presidential election year. So um, it is something that I have thought of. It's something that I started planning back in May. Um, and so one of the things that I'm um, advocating for all of our college students, as well as anyone who would be in an at-risk population, I'm advocating vote by mail um, because for a number of reasons, for safety concerns, number one. Also, um, the part of the change in the legislation is the state is going to pick up the postage bill for um, us being able to uh, mail out the request form. So the Secretary of State, um, as of July 1st, is going to mail out uh, a 2020 vote by mail um, application to request the ballot to every registered voter statewide. And it's going to be posted paid so that all they have to do, all voters have to do is complete it and mail it back. It'll come to our, us directly. So to be um, addressed to the town hall, we will um, process it. And so when we receive their ballot, I mean, excuse me, when we receive their application and we receive the ballot, we'll mail it to them and the postage is going to be paid on that as well. And so that's an incentive because you hear a lot of times that it costs sometimes, depending on the weight of the ballot, it can cost anywhere from a dollar to a dollar fifty to um, mail the ballot out and to receive it back. And so that's the one of the plans that I have um, in place. Some others are forthcoming that I don't want to talk about right at this moment. Um, out of respect, um, and it'll be on your agenda for next week's meeting. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, follow up, Andy? Yes. Um, how are we going to know that these students haven't applied not only in their campus residence, but in their local home? How is that going to be checked so that we can avoid uh, people voting twice. So in the state of Massachusetts, our voter registration information system is a statewide system that prohibits duplication. So when someone registers to vote in one community, if they're registered already in another community, it'll take them off the roll in the community where they are. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Lynn. Yeah, I actually want to just reemphasize something that Shavina said, and that is she is on the agenda on Monday the 20th to talk about the upcoming election and her plans. And so uh, for issues that are not budget related, we can take them up then. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Not Dorothy. I'll wait for I'll wait for Monday. Okay, sounds fair enough. Anything else from any members of the committee? Mary Lou, yes, yeah, hands is down. Um, so, anything else? I thank you very much for the thank presentation you for and uh, welcome to you know. Thank it's you. really been great to have you. And uh, now that you're now you're a veteran of Amherst, so <laughs> thank, you. thank you so uh, much. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> it's been great working with you and looking forward to continuing to work with you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, 
I think that we're at the end for general government, except for one section, and that is um, the uh, facilities maintenance. And I guess my question to either Sean, do we have anybody, uh, maybe just Sean, do we have anyone here for that section? So I thought we did that one quickly last week when um, Jeremiah and Rob were here. I think we did that one quickly. Oh, that's right. yeah. So the only thing we have left is debt service? Uh, yeah. General government, I mean, um, general services. Oh, okay, yeah, after facilities, right, there's. Okay, so okay. general services, uh, let's cover that. And then, and then uh, what I was gonna suggest so that we can get to public comment is that uh, we put that, sir, just continue that service into the next meeting? Um, I had sent the, uh, the grid that showed the things that we needed to get through today that were highlighted in yellow. And on that, um, the retirement assessment in the regional and the uh, OPEB is on there, but we had already talked about that and voted that in the um, one month budget, but we have to rescind the one month budget in order to put this one in place. So I didn't know if you wanted to bring that up again. So I highlighted that, but there's debt service and there's also the optional tax exemption that we have to accept every year. Yeah. As well. And I sent all that information in my email to everybody. I'm just keeping an eye on the on the clock and uh, recognizing that we uh, put in an extra meeting this week and uh, so that we uh, could, if there was any last pieces that we could put over for tomorrow, uh, we may actually have more time and be able to um, hear from any members of the public who um, are still seeking recognition. It should be quick. Oh, several different topics. Um, but anything on general services, let's cover that for sure. I can run through that one real quick, Sonia, and if you wanna um, chime in. Sure. Uh, so that area has our, our um, liability insurance, our professional insurance, property insurance, um, some other general, again, it's, it is general services. So it's things that cover a lot of departments like postage and um, telephones, the audit, equipment maintenance. Um, the big increase you see there, the 32.9%, that, that's what we talked about earlier, where we moved legal um, from its own section into this section. Um, I think that accounts for just about uh, the majority of that increase, right, Sonia? Yep. Um, and so, yeah, this is sort of a, a you know, operational section of the budget. There's not a lot of goals here. In the legal services, was not, if I recall, I don't have it right in front of me, it's not an increase from the prior year. It's just moved from it from its own section. Right. Yep. It's level budgeted, yes. Okay. Uh, Kathy, did you? I just had a, a quick question on, on page 45, the vehicles insured. Is that number of vehicles that are just part of general government? You know, on um, whose vehicles are those is what I, or are those all the vehicle? I mean, is that vehicles, uh, fire engine and every vehicle we have in town? That's just, that's at all of them. And that'll be actually part of the capital improvement program as well. That's one okay. the main area where we pull our vehicle information is from what's insured. Um, it may, um, Holly or, or Sonia may know, it may also include some things that aren't necessarily what you would consider a vehicle as well. Um, some equipment that has to be insured. Um, okay. So. That was just, that was my question. So, so when Guilford told us that he has 110, he's about half of all the vehicles. Yeah, the schools have 20 or 30 of the police and fire that are in that number. So um, it includes all of them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dorothy? Just a real quick one. Since they're all here, I want to say that this budget book is absolutely a miracle. Um, a regular person can read it and understand it. And I have no idea how much work it took to make this book, but I really, really appreciate it. So thank you to you all. Thank, thank Holly and Sonia. Ho Holly's hair was not purple at the beginning of this process. And, and by the end of the budget book, there you go. Gray. <laughs>
Okay, uh, well, thank you to all of you, too, for the uh, book. So, um, you had brought up several topics, Sonia, and uh, is there really a reason why we can't just hold it for tomorrow at this point? Um, Are you going That's fine. I mean, debt service is pretty simple. It is our debt service, and we kind of see that all the time. So I don't know if there's a lot of questions on our debt service. It's going down until we start building these buildings. But well, we borrow money and then right. it goes up. Right. No, I think the, the question that the one question I had had Lynn asked the other day on it looked like you ha, you must have refinanced because the interest rates went down on some of the things compared to last year's budget book and I think you said you had done that. Um, we don't refinance, but we have a lot of of bands out there right now, bond anticipation notes. Okay. So that changes every year, and sometimes we don't have an interest rate when we're putting the budget book together. Sometimes we do. So um, when we're estimating it, we, we ask our financial advisor and he tells us four or 5% because we don't know where we're going from here. So that will fluctuate once they're permanently bonded. If we permanently bond all of them, which we probably won't, then it becomes a, a permanent number. But we don't refinance very often unless there's, unless there's gonna be savings to a lower um, interest rate which hasn't really been the case for a lot of years because interest rates have been so low. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Dorothy, did you have something about that service? Dorothy, you're muted. Uh, no, I, I hadn't taken my hand down, I'm fine, thank oh, okay. you. All right. Um, the other subjects you were going to uh, you bring your optional tax thing. Um, those were pieces you put into the packet. Yes, it was three. Um, it was the attachment three and three point one. Three is the actual order, and three point one was a memo from our assessor Liz um, explaining what our exemptions were for last year. Um, why don't we hold that for tomorrow? And um, does, is everybody in the, uh, since there was some confusion earlier, uh, make sure that uh, if you haven't looked into the packet for today's meeting, that you do so and look at those documents before we have the discussion, because uh, some people had missed the question and answers because they didn't realize that they were in the posted packet. And I will send out a note after the meeting explaining that and where to find the packet if you haven't been able to find it. Um, or unless you want to cover it because it I, looks like Liz is still here. I'm here to answer the questions on the local option exemption that she's discussing if we need to. Okay. Um, actually, let me see if I, I do have it available to um, show on the screen or, um, oops, I just uh, think I accidentally ran into a problem. Do you have it available or shall I look for it? Um, I have one that has a question mark with the base for the FYI, but I don't know if we ever found the, the solution, but I can share this document that I have in the front of me. I believe it's the one that I submitted to you, Sonia. We should I email know it too. I have it in front of me, but I have the one with the question mark for the base on the F, F the fiscal year for the base. Who has control to share, Sean? Um, are you looking for the approval order that has the local exemption? I can bring that on the screen. It would be personal exemptions fiscal year 2020. Uh, the reimbursement would be in fiscal 21. These are local additional exemptions. I can share the one I have, basically. It's the same thing. John, it's good to see emailed you, 3 and 3.1. Give it, Sean, or 
Uh, you said you just emailed it to me, Sonia. Yeah, let me pull it up. Let me see. A few minutes ago to you and, and Paul. Is it, um, it's CO number three? Yeah. Yeah, I can pull that up. Let me, let me share the first one and then um, tell me if that's it. And then the second one is 3.1. <clears throat> is there a place in particular we're supposed to be looking at for the shared? Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've been, I've been the share earner, not the share. That's the council earner. Yeah, the next, it's the next one, Sean. Three, well, next one in. Yeah, exactly. exactly. No, in, terms of, in terms of documents, there was a, a next document that's labeled 3.1 FY. Let me get that one. That's the one. All right. It's the only Word document in that email. Is this is it up on the screen right now? Nope. Um, huh. The Word, the Word document. Are you guys you guys aren't seeing it on the screen? No, no we're seeing your email. Uh, let me. Any emails? Let me try it again. Switch screen, Sean. Maybe. Uh, do you see it now? There you go. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Yep. That's basically what I'm looking at. Okay. So basically, what you're looking at there is um, the optional exemptions allowed by MGL to add an additional exemption to the existing exemptions that they mandate by the state. And the town of uh, Amherst has option for additional surviving uh, spouse of veteran and and disabled and uh, surviving parents of a, of a son or daughter killed in action or a spouse, uh, surviving spouse of, a, of a, um, a husband or wife killed in action, um, legally blind and senior, um, and the senior regulations are pretty in depth, so I won't go into them too much, but those are available if anybody's interested. Um, I hope to get out to some of our local organizations to uh, expand on these exemptions that are offer, offered only in the town of Amherst um, for these local options um, to our local organizations for seniors and veterans. Um, basically, we're looking at a local option exemption of uh, 108,971. Am I correct, Sonia? Sorry. The, the, the local options in total are 108,971. In three cents, and then uh, the state will reimburse us thirty three thousand three thirty eight of that amount, and the rest is supported by the, the community. So our local option portion, um, you know, we add an additional thirty nine thousand, almost forty thousand dollars. See if I can explain it correctly, just to make it for, for people who are unfamiliar with the process. The base exemption amount is required. Um, the optional piece is a local option that we can add to the amount. Um, town meeting over the years has always adopted the local option so that we can provide the benefit to the largest extent permissible, um, even though it does reduce our taxation by that amount. It's a valid. Uh, it has always been deemed to be a valid expenditure, and uh, but it has to be voted annually. And I think if I stated it correctly, Sonia. Yeah. So um, I think that we we basically are going to be asked again to do this, and uh, this has uh, is this the assessor's role um, has valued. Um, made the estimates of the value that of the local exemption that we would have to vote on to continue to offer them to um, the veterans and legally blind and seniors who are eligible questions uh, to go back to the participant list and see if there are any questions. And uh, Lynn. Um. I assume this is not the same as the program 
where seniors can work to up to a certain amount to have their taxes reduced? No, no. that is not included in this. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I just wanna, can I, can I say something, Andy? Um, yes. The attachment that's labeled number three, that is the actual order, but the second page of that is uh, the last year's memo from David Burgess, so ignore that second page. I'll send it out with just, without that page. Okay. I do this every year, so I didn't notice David's was attached to it. <laughs> okay, so you'll reset, you'll... Right. You'll replace the packet. Piece. I'll replace it with Liz's. Okay, great. Uh, Dorothy. Um, I'm having trouble reading it. So um, uh, let's take the first one. Does Axe, is that six people yes. going to get that amount? Axe means accounts. Accounts, okay. Okay. What this so, stands for is this MGL chapter 53. Three is the, is the section of the law that allows us mm -hmm. to, uh, or the chapter of the law that allows us to offer these. This is the specific subsection for each of these. So, um, so I don't know how much it really is then, because if six people get a total of three thousand four hundred, so I divide six into that, and I come out to about five hundred dollars each. So they get, yes. They get five. Okay. So the yes. huge amount for the veterans is that there's fifty people dividing up $58,000. And right. so they're going to get maybe like $800 or something like that. Right. We're not talking a large amount of money, okay. but it is significant to those in this vulnerable population right. that could right. really use the assistance. Okay. I uh, thank you. I just need a little clarification. Not thank at all. You. And we would be voting on the optional portion addition. of it. Right. To continue the optional additional uh, exemption. Okay, um, does that answer your question, Dorothy? Oops. It does. So, um, do we want to actually let's hold um, hold off and hold all motions till the next two meetings? Uh, but the motion that would be was is whether or not to again offer the optional local exemption and whether to recommend that action to the council. I'd like so to we, take a minute to recognize my assistant, Teresa uh, Sarna. She's not with me today. Uh, she's actually having eye surgery. It's pretty dramatic for her. And she's been administrating and uh, coordinating those efforts for all those benefit programs for our, our very needy uh, individuals in the community. And uh, she's been really great at it. I gotta say, I haven't been here all that long, um, but she's been very patient and she's uh, really very efficient. But I'd like to put a shout wish out there. Wish her, wish her well on our behalf and thank her. Thank for, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I don't see anything else unless Dorothy, you still have your hand up. Is that a vestige of before? Mary Lou, you have something you just. Could we go? Are we off of debt? Uh, yes. We're okay. uh, I had a question. back to that if you want. Yes, I, I do have one on, um, it's on page 179, and I, I may not be understanding this correctly. It's Appendix D. The E Street School renovations, we're still paying on a $700,000 bond. And I thought at some point we stopped work on that school because the um, the elevator was going to be expensive and and all of the codes and everything. And we're still paying on that, it looks like, into the future also. I can answer that. The reason it's labeled E Street School is because that's where we originally borrowed the funds under, but we had repurposed a lot of that debt for other projects that happened through the town. So we used that money that was borrowed for other projects. We had revotes at town meeting for it, but it's still named E Street School just so we can track that debt and that bond that we actually originally borrowed for. Oh, good, because I was wondering if this building is standing there and if we're still doing stuff with not a good idea. No, Thank we you. never went through with it. So, 
Other questions? That was a good question. Thank you. All right. So I think that we're uh, then uh, finished with general government and uh, we will uh, vote on uh, the whole series of issues at one time, um, including the optional exemptions, but we're not um, going to take the vote today. Um, since we have had some very patient attendees who and we had uh, notified uh, for public comment. Um, Lynn, can you put the um, a, the agenda back on because it's I think had a statement about uh, the uh, public comment rules, and then I was going to just try and go through and uh, to. Um, so public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of the Finance Committee are allowed under um, general public comment. They're not limited to subjects that were discussed, but um, we welcome um, always uh, public comment. And there are people who've been very patiently waiting for that opportunity. So um, what I'm going to do is go back um, in my own section and look at the participant list. And um, at this point, we have a fairly large number of people who have indicated that they would like to speak. And so I'm going to um, have to probably try and limit this if I can to, uh, let's say, a minute and a half is what I'll try and do. I'm going to set a timer. And, um, but I would just I um, ask you to um, introduce yourself and um, the, indicate that you're a resident of Amherst by telling us at least uh, what part of town you live in, what um, of the council districts. And uh, so I'm going to uh, go in order. And uh, if you spoke last night and uh, I, I, we took very careful notes and so I urge um, you, I can't say, I'm not going to interrupt okay. you, but please don't uh, try not to repeat okay. from what you said last night. Anything else from the committee before I start the list? If not, uh, Brian Monison Olson, I believe is correct. And if I'm incorrect, please uh, correct me. Thank you. That was close. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Monison Olson. Uh, I am a resident of District 5 in South Amherst. Um, thank you for, for letting me speak. Um, I'm a parent and an educator in Amherst, and I've lived here for 13 years now. Um, and I'm trying to respond to uh, some of the things that were said by uh, the police department and, and the fire department. And I just want to urge the town council to carry out the demands put forward by defund 413 and reduce the police budget by 52%. Um, police departments are historically racist organizations uh, and they don't meet the needs of our society at this point. Um, as illustrated by their own uh, statistics, over 90, uh, I think 96% of calls to the police are for nonviolent issues and the police enforce the law with violence or the threat of violence. Uh, they have been asked continually to do more and more roles that they are not suited for in their training um, and that has become a progressive problem that we need to uh, address. Uh, we need to more intelligently distribute our tax dollars to provide the essential services that reduce crime and help communities flourish. Uh, continued investment in violent law enforcement is backwards and really fails to consider the his uh, our history or the current moment. Amherst has 18 times more police officers employed uh, by the town than public health workers or social workers. There was some commentary on that we shouldn't be reducing our police force during a pandemic. We should be focused on public health. Uh, that's, that's the obvious solution here. As Chief Livingston noted the high frequency of mental health calls, stating that it was roughly one third of calls. And he said mental health assistance is often not available from other organizations. We need to fix that problem. When an officer shows up for a quote unquote warm knock for someone who has been experiencing a mental health issue or a drug crisis, it's really well documented at this point that the presence of a uniformed officer with a gun more often than not is gonna escalate that situation. 
we need to take a holistic, nonviolent approach to our future that redistributes our money in a way that acknowledges the painful lessons that have shown without a doubt that violent law enforcement is part of the problem and should be a thing of the past. I'm proud of Amherst, and I believe we can really move forward with a more intelligent and compassionate view of law enforcement and social well-being. Um, so please conclude. Uh, thank you for, for uh, your attention. Well, thank you. Uh, Kinga McCraven. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, I am Kinga McCraven, a queer black woman who graduated from Pelham Elementary School, Amherst Middle and High School, and UMass. I'm a local educator and community leader working to improve our culture here because I did not feel safe in any of those spaces. I was in awe last night of everyone who was brave enough to name their experiences and how our town upholds racist institutions, such as the police department and school district. I was heartbroken to watch the council with mostly blank stares and lifeless expressions, especially when folks were sharing devastating examples of the harm they have experienced and witnessed in Amherst, which today I heard questioned and minimized. I did not speak last night because I feel unsafe speaking to this council of people who do not display passion or empathy and are not a true representation of our community. Police and question the voices of their community and protect the racist institutions in our town. I feel this harm in my body and spirit and use immense strength to speak to my truth to you today. I urge you to reflect on how it is possible that the town can combat race, systemic racism with 0.1% of the entire budget. This is not about whether individuals are inherently good or not, but the gross funding to a racist institution who is responding to calls concerning the health and wellness of our community instead of addressing health head on. We need to invest in the general wellness of our community and build up a public health and safety outside of the institutions that uphold systemic racism, rather than funding institutions that are not experienced with such issues. We suffer from a lack of access to safe spaces, mental health services, transportation, and essential human resources, which we, I do not see being addressed in this budget. There is a, health, a food apartheid in this, in this town with no grocery stores that are accessible and inclusive, let alone offer affordable quality foods. I am board president of Common Share Food Co-op, which is working to create a space addressing this lack in Amherst while building an anti-racist community owned and led grocery store. I'm founder of Counterculture Educator, where we help creative leaders turn around the culture of their community. These are only two examples of projects that truly address the health of our entire community and the town needs to be committed to. We need a space owned and operated by black people, specifically serving the black community. Just as this council has paid time to decide how to up best uplift and support the town, black residents deserve the same treatment. There, will be a, there must be a thorough conversation between our black community and the town of Amherst with adequate time to assess and create a legitimate plan. Asking black community leaders to service this community for free is a continued violation of black livelihood. Cut the Amherst Police Department by 52% to directly improve the public health and safety in our town. Do not give any of this money to any institution such as the police or school district. Pay black community leaders to establish a task force to create a solid plan to adequately address the systemic racism. Please finish up. Give this task force of black community leaders the authority to direct the town on how to allocate further funds needed to support the plan to combat structural racism. Be responsible with this money by not rushing into this important decision and put it in an interest bearing account until a plan has been formulated. There is no quick fix to structural racism. We need to approach this with a long term change in mind. This is absolutely possible, but only if the town chooses to be on the right side of history and stand against structural and institutionalized, institutionalized racism that thrives in Amherst. Okay, please finish. Okay, thank you very much. I'm trying to keep, uh, make sure we have time for everybody. Um, somebody has signed on and is listed as counterculture educator, but I assume that there's somebody who's um, signed on that way who can identify themselves um, and please spell your last name and uh, introduce where. Tell us where you live in town. Hello? Yes. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> My name is DW. I'm an Amherst elementary, middle and high school graduate. I'm also a former employee of the Amherst School District. And I was tasked with establishing the inaugural restorative justice program. I've created and developed programs in Chicago and in Western Mass that speak to the power of transformational community approaches. I know that we cannot transform what we cannot see. Looking at this board, I have not observed adequate representation of the people that live in Amherst. 
I'm not just talking about race. I observed how this group attempted to use one black man's voice as if we are a monolith. I agree that we need public safety. Defunding the police will do just that. Public safety isn't only police. Public safety is empowering, paying, and training the community on transformational justice practices to make sure those around us are also safe. I am, I am public safety, and I take my job seriously. Ask John Mangiano. He has personally experienced the tenacity and care in which I show up for my community. I shouldn't have to join the police force to be paid to take care of my community when I know there are alternative solutions outside of policing that work. In restorative justice, we uplift a saying, how are the children? And if we cannot all unequivocally say in unison that the children are well, we have a serious problem. Racism is a public health crisis. Structural racism in Amherst is a problem. This meeting structure is problematic and is an example of structural racism. The police department spoke for over an hour justifying their actions while the general public is policed on the length of our comments and our comment topics. Herein lies the problem. I know most, if not all of you, don't get that. That's why you also need community support. Defund the police by 52% so we can get the work of supporting a community we love. Thank you for your comment. Um, Hamilcar Shabazz. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, yes, Hamilcar Shabazz. I uh, live in District 5, and I'm a proud employee of the University of Massachusetts, where we teach our students to be revolutionary, to think critically, question power, and above all, to be ambitious. Now, while I openly identify myself as someone who works and has his check signed by the University of Massachusetts, I don't react emotionally because you all had a discussion about actions going on to try to value the property and assess the property value to try to get more out of UMass in terms of payment in lieu of taxes. I don't go into a knee-jerk reaction like that because you're doing that as the town of Amherst, even though I'm a UMass employee. And likewise, I thought it very unhelpful and uh, to this conversation to, and I can understand where he's coming from. Scott Livingston is his colleague, is his fellow chief, but you know, Tim, I, I, who identified himself as a black man and gave his personal focus. Well, I'm a black man as well. And I don't, but I don't want to give my, go into my own personal thing here. I want to keep it uh, um, on topic. I want to not go emotional, but I have to respond right now to say that to reduce this to people are just acting emotionally because of the eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, tape of George Floyd or we're reacting emotionally because of some animus for the police. That's nowhere in this conversation. I like my chief. I uh, have uh, 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 Chief Livingston. Is, my interactions have been uh, very positive. But the real question here is about being revolutionary, thinking critically, questioning power, being ambitious, and looking at this moment as an opportunity to begin to reassess and rethink the budget. I don't give a particular percentage. I'm not going to sign on here to 52%. Maybe it's 100. But we've got to start the process now of thinking about the functions, of thinking about where we can involve and validate and, and create programs like a cahoots or something that can begin to put p uh, people uh, in front of unarmed people on putting unarmed trained people who are appropriate for those circumstances in front of un unarmed people. Of course, where there's a violent threat, yes, you need, you need a force that can deal with that. But we are too militarized. There's too much of a focus on militarism and on a warrior culture in all police departments that we, it's time for us to rethink our dependence on that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shabazz. 
Um, uh, Rick Last. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's really hard after waiting all day, and I echo what other people said. So I have one and a half minutes to share after you know so much time was given, you know, to uh, uh, the the police, which seemed to be a lot of the re a repeat of the earlier town council police call. So uh, this this whole process seems really wrong kind of um, antithetical to participation. So the defund campaign is about systematic patterns of racism in the uh, Amherst Police Department. You're right, no one has been you know, murdered by the police in Amherst, but did you really hear the testimonies last night about people's experience? Does that matter? It was a key point made by the speakers and in my opinion, was virtually dismissed today. Um, Ms. Friedman called the uh, Amherst Police Department above par in reference to uh, responses to um, mental and public health. But above par, I, I don't know what that means. It usually doesn't win any tournaments, but um, uh, still we're going, um, we still need to go back to the statement that um, Captain Young was talking about, uh, we are not clinicians, we don't pretend to be, this is not our job. Um, so if, if you, uh, you listed a great set of resources and they should be used, all these social agencies and resources, but they should be used at the point of the crisis. That only makes sense. The crisis is now for these people. And the police do not need to show up, as so many people said. And I'll repeat the um, uh, the statistics from the Cahoots program: seventeen thousand calls were rerouted to Cahoots, and one percent, less than one percent, required any kind of uh, police presence or police calls. That is really important to to, to think about. So it's our job to do best for the community. And that is what's best for the community. With a police officer showing up, too many things go wrong. At the very least, pass only a one month budget and spend that month paying a collection of BIPOC folks to give you the answers that you need around the budget, especially the police budget. Let's take a deeper look. That's the least. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Last. A number of people had their hands up, and then all of a sudden, they appeared off of my. Yeah, that screen. that was my fault. Sorry, this Sean. I I hit the lower all hands button by accident. So anybody who had their hands up, I are just going to have to raise them again. I'm terribly sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So we can, because I I'm, unfortunately um, I take them in order that they were um, up previously. Now some, I'm seeing some hands that had been pre, uh, of people who have been previously I, uh, recognized um, in today's meeting. And I ask you uh, if you've been recognized once to please not uh, uh, ask again. Uh, it's, let's work with a honor system. But I, um, uh, Lynn, have you been keeping track of the uh, people, of the names? Uh, I, I do. I haven't. But uh, I think you should start with the top of the list. It's about all you can do at this point. Okay. Um, if you've identified anyone who's uh, already spoken, then uh, please somehow let me know. Uh, but. Um, Zoe Crabtree, uh, I know we heard from you last night, but not today, please um, unmute. And... Okay, Zoe, I think you can go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, as you said, I did speak last night. Um, I live in District 5. I just wanted to uh, share some information um, that I think you'll be very interested in about the uh, officer-initiated calls and the follow-up calls. Um, like I shared yesterday, we um, have all access of, to all of the call logs that we downloaded from the Amherst Police website. 
um, and we were able to put them into a spreadsheet format so that they're very easily queried. Um, when I look at the uh, number of um, of police calls that were initiated by the police, the initiated calls that you were speaking about earlier, um, there are 4,922 of them total. Um, only 769 of them, 15%, are follow-up calls. So I think that there, were, there was some conversation earlier about, well, maybe most of the calls that are listed as officer-initiated are really just follow-up, and so they're just skewing the numbers. Um, that doesn't bear out in my analysis of the data. It looks like follow-up calls, at least the way that they're tagged in your system, um, under the call reason, uh, not the call type, uh, it's only 15% of those officer-initiated calls. The, call, the rest of the officer-initiated calls seem to be much more of this active policing that, that you all as a council frame as something that's really positive. Um, but what you should be hearing from what everyone has been telling you the last night and today is that that active policing is really harmful. Um, and when people say violence, they don't necessarily mean, you know, someone taking out a gun and shooting them. They mean, uh, like, <laughs> being watched, being perceived as suspicious, um, being over-policed in, in everything that you're doing, having that, uh, having that be looked at more than anyone else. Um, that is violence, and that's what everyone is speaking to here. Um, and that bears out in, in the data about officer-initiated calls. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Terry Mullen. Hi, uh, similar to what Zoe was saying, I'm a town resident. I live on Northeast Street. Um, I did the maps for the data analysis that you can find um, at, at defund 413 Amherst or sorry, I can't remember, I'm nervous, um, the Instagram account um, that you've all been sent. Uh, and I just redid the data. I dropped all follow-up calls from the data and just looked at the initiated calls and the same exact places are lighting up as being more proactively policed. And please listen to the BIPOC who are saying that being proactively policed harms them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the next person I see is, um, and if I don't get your name right, um, pronounced right, please speak up. N.J. Rebillus, please join us. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, NJ, it stands for Nicole Jessica. I live at 36 Hulse Road in Amherst and I teach at Holyoke High School. I don't think I've ever noticed a police car or officer in my neighborhood, which is Precinct 8, which is predominantly white. As a teacher, of course, my bias is for funding schools, school counselors, more teachers, especially during the pandemic. Um, I'm really glad to hear that our police are mental health first aid and CIT trained. I'm actually a certified trainer with Youth Mental Health First Aid and it's a great program but I'm not really sure why we're training police to do mental health work instead of hiring psychology specialists to intervene and support in a crisis. Why can't healthcare providers be first responders? Why is a drug addiction response team run by police and not EMTs? We need a hiring freeze and general defunding for the Amherst Police Department. I would love to see our tax dollars supporting things like education, food justice, housing, access to healthcare, all sorts of non-police town services. Expanding public internet access sounds like a great place to invest as a town, especially municipal fiber, which was discussed today. I'm really hoping that Amherst will be a leader in solutions for policing and community services. Thank you for your time and consideration. I really hope that you listen to the Black people in our community on this issue. Well, thank you very much. Uh, keeping moving along, um, Alexandra Monson Olson. Yeah, she already spoke. That's what I thought. I spoke uh, last night, as well as uh, a couple of other folks who have spoken again today. Um, but I did speak last night. Yeah. I believe a partner or someone else in her household may have spoken, but yeah, not my, my my partner spoke earlier, Brian. So you haven't spoken today. No, so. I have not. So please join us. Uh, thank you I'm, uh, for clarifying that. Yep. Um, so I am Lexi Monison Olson. I've lived in Amherst for 13 years. I live in District 5, represented by Councillors Dumont and Balmilne. 
Um, I have two children who go to Crocker Farm and a third who will attend when they're old enough. Um, I wanted to first clarify in the beginning of my statement that the words you heard last night were absolutely about the local police department and policing situation, not a knee-jerk response to the national condition. The statements being made are based on facts pulled from your data, your budget, your published documents, and bolstered by firsthand experience. You need to be realistic about the very strong community response that you're seeing to this budget and this police department. More specifically, I would like to talk about the indication that you work with organizations in the area, such as the fire department, to determine appropriate services in a given situation when a call comes in. Only about 12% of calls are, that are responded to by the police department actually come from a 911 call. 44% are initiated by the cops themselves. And while you indicated earlier today that what we referred to as patrolling is follow-up, according to your own statistics, this only accounts for 15% of the police initiated calls. This is not problem stabilization. This is patrolling and instigating, and I do not feel as though this policing helps to keep our town and community safe, especially considering that different parts of our community are policed differently. You say that 100% of your officers are required to be trained in mental health first aid, but you could not possibly handle a mental health crisis as well as a mental health professional. Why does the town not employ crisis intervention response teams rather than police officers to respond in these situations? We budget for 48 officers, but only two public health workers and two social workers. In fact, the social services budget has been reduced from $80,000 in 2018 to $20,000 in 2019 and zero for 2020. I understand that decisions need to be made and the budget is tight this year, but clearly social services are not what need to be cut. Armed officers are generally not needed in a mental health crisis and they often, as we heard in public testimony last night, scare people, make them anxious and escalate situations. I'm also hearing you say that many of the calls you respond to are not service calls, but rather harm reduction calls. Why do we need police officers for these calls at all? Why are we investing resources and in providing trainings for armed officers rather than recruiting and incorporating educators, mental health care workers, and others to provide the actual services that are needed? I agree that public health and safety are crucial, Julie, but we do not need harm reduction responses from armed police officers. We need community services that support all Amherst residents to live healthy, safe lives. The police do not provide this. Above par is not an appropriate standard. We need to devote financial resources to services in the town that will actually provide safety and reflect the values we claim to have. Mr. Bockelman, if you feel as though the town has not had sufficient time to have these conversations, then I challenge the council to pass another one month, one month budget to allow for that time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, Michelle, Hi there. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Michelle and I live in District 1. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am speaking today to share a personal experience. Um, I've been living in Amherst since uh, 1998. Um, I married um, a man who also lives in Amherst and I'm now divorced from him, but he is extremely um, mentally ill. And so I have worked closely with the Amherst Police Department over the years um, to manage the situation. Um, I do wanna be very clear that I believe that systemic racism is alive and well, not only you know, globally, nationally, and in Amherst. I also believe that over-policing is harmful. Um, but I just want to point out that um, when it comes to the particulars of these situations and seeing um, my ex-husband and the father of my two children um, basically become sick in front of our eyes, um, and I... I want to say that the Amherst Police Department has been extremely compassionate um, and, uh, you know, not perfect by any means, um, but I have found them to be extremely compassionate. Um, but he has, just like in the month of February, there were 20 calls um, just for him um, for disturbing the peace. And, you know, they go out there and they, they check in with him and they take him over to, you know, Northampton to be evaluated. And he gets, you know, he comes back the next day and it 
is a very, very difficult situation for everybody involved. Um, my children, you know, after George Floyd's brutal murder, my children asked me if that was going to happen to their dad. And I, there's nothing in my heart that believes anything like that with the Amherst Police Department at all. But the reality is, is that their frustration is extreme. And I do very, very, very strongly believe that they need the support of specialized mental health um, professionals to do their job better and to support our community better. Um, you know, I've been on the other side of things where I've had a restraining order against him and where maybe the police did over police. I don't know, but maybe they did um, drive by a bunch and just kind of keep their eyes on things. And, and for me, that did provide some sense of safety for myself and my children. So I think we're kind of all in some ways, I think we might be saying some of the same things in that, you know, the, the police need more help in these circumstances and they need not, you know, it's wonderful that they're trained, as I think Lexi said, um, but they need specialized professionals. If my ex-husband had a professional so, show up. Train, train. Uh, Sorry. Up yep, okay. that's that's basically it. I really believe that if some money was, uh, if if this was frozen until a larger conversation could happen, and if um, there was money that was set aside in some sort of account or something like that, instead of you know um, just rushing into a decision, I believe that would benefit the community greatly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, somebody has signed on uh, with an indication of peace and love. And uh, so whoever you are, please uh, Hello? It's my turn. tell us your name and uh, where you live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, first of all, I hope that I'm finding you all in good health and in good spirits. Um, my name is Jose Adastra, and I'm an advocate for your local homeless in Northampton and Amherst. Um, and I lived right on the border of uh, Amherst and Palmer for two and a half years. I have a family of seven, and I specifically elected to send my kids out of the Amherst school system when you had police officers in it. Um, and so I just want to say that I'm coming here with the voice of the first people. Um, and I want to remind you that you're trying to den deny that there's systemic racism in a town that's named after a guy who spreads smallpox and blankets to Native American communities. So <clears throat> I think that it'd be really wise for you to remember that and uh, remember that there's no Native American people here for a reason. It's because you prospered off of their death. And now the people that you have oppressed afterwards are uprising, they're rising. Um, black people need protection. Um, I would like to really thank the, I believe his name was Tim, Chief Tim Nelson, I believe, for his testimony. And I would like to say that I have family and, and even in Amherst, that's the cop, that, that they're cops and they do a lot of good work. But uh, this is that thing about, you know, one or two people that are doing really good work doesn't make up for this system where the roots are corrupted. Um, I want to remind you that most of crime is uh, monitored, um, knowingly monitored. And I come from a family that suffered from incarceration and oppression. I'm from Puerto Rico, and we've been being oppressed for over 500 years. Okay, the police there have sold their allegiance to local drug dealers so that not even the inhabitants of the island can have any peace because they're protected by not only the police, but the CIA. And this is your drug war. Okay, this is what Reagan started and the CIA started. And for some reason, you people don't want to take any responsibility for it. But um, indigenous people all over the world are suffering and, and you're, you're brushing it off. I, I need to recommend a couple things to you. The okay. voice of the first people, real quick. Seconds so we can yes, start. sir. Thank you very much. 
you need to double the amount of meetings that you have and you need to stop making people wait to talk about this. You need to prioritize the racial aspects of all of this because human life is being lost all over the US territories. And everyone will remember you as delaying in uh, combating that. I am an educator. I have traveled all over the world to teach art and music and love and healing. And I will teach of you people. And I hope that you behave in a way that I can teach positively of you. Please open your ears and your heart to a new future filled with imagination and brilliance that your community is bringing you. And don't turn them down. You should be employing the people that are coming here so they can show you and they can lead the way. God bless you and good health to you. Thank you very much. Um, somebody who has a, who's calling in and for, 304 is part of their phone number, I believe. And I um, welcome you and ask you please identify yourself and uh, where you live and then uh, what's in your mind. Can you, do you hear me? So I can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead and uh, tell us who you are and where you live and, uh, and what you have to say. Yes, thank you. My name is Gazit Kayanakosi. I live in District 5 and I'm sharing today after listening last night and this morning. Um, I'm disturbed but not surprised at how public comment has been limited when the police were given over an hour today. The people are asking you as a council to do what you agreed to do, to represent our needs. And right now, those needs are not a response to the national conversation. It is demeaning and dehumanizing to apply, imply that our sharing is some sort of unfounded hysteria. It is clear that our town residents have experienced police profiling and violence here in Amherst. This local prob problem is urgent and life-threatening even more so because of the added impact of COVID. I am asking that the town council act in line with the will of the people rather than to the will of the town manager or police department. In so doing, to answer the people, I ask that the town council create another one month budget and convene a residence council for racial justice and equity with black, indigenous and people of color as paid members to advise the council and the town manager on the budget moving forward. There are more than enough community members ready and willing to serve in this capacity, as you have seen last night and today. As my eight-year-old has been with me listening last night and today for many hours, I shared that it is not that you all are bad people. It is that you are unable to admit that you've made a mistake and to commit to doing something different. So in the words of my eight-year-old, please admit that you've done something wrong. It's okay. Just do something now about it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Is it, um, Alicia Desharnas, I think I have it right, but if I'm not, please correct me. Yes. Hi, my name is Alicia Desharnas. You were very close. I'm a resident of District 2. Someone last night said that cutting the police department budget by 52% would make that budget unbalanced. But we already spend so much more per resident on the police department, almost $136, than the library, $69, public health, only $3.77, a senior center, $5.99, and veteran services, only $7.42. Social services budget has been reduced from 80K in 2018 to 20K in 2019 to $0 for 2020. We need to pay attention to how we're spending our money and make sure we're putting it where our mouth is, where we say that our towns, what we say that our town stands for. You all have the opportunity to do that. You're in positions of power. You get to make decisions about this budget. The police spent time today making arguments that they are good people. That's not what we're arguing about. We're talking about the budget and where town finances go. Please take that into consideration and hear the voices of people who've spoken today. 
particularly the people of color who've taken time to share and educate this, this group. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, Curry Couts. Uh... Yeah, um, so I'm probably gonna be really short. I talked yesterday. Um, I wanted to talk specifically on the mental health thing um, because that directly affects me as I spent um, four years um, prior to living in Amherst in um, facilities and I have never once um, seen <laughs> police involvement that hasn't escalated um, the situation um, and like I know like there's not um, perfect solutions to those issues but there's basically anything but the police is better um, I don't see any reason why we should be funding the police to help people um, when that's not their job. And I am also asking for defunding the police. Um, I'm asking for 52%. And I really hope you listen to the people who are talking and that like these people are real. There's been people who are saying that um, like these things don't happen, but we've heard testimonies from people who say there is racial profiling and to not listen to that is just disrespectful um, and really proves that you are in a position where you don't have to listen. Um, and I'm just urging you to care. Um, and really that's it. Um, and thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Ms. Couch. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Lauren, um... Please identify yourself and uh, where you live and uh, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, my name is Lauren Reingold. I'm a former resident of Amherst, but I've worked in the center of Amherst for 10 years and maybe a future resident as I just graduated nursing school and will hopefully be working in the community in that respect wherever a job will take me. Um, and, and so that's where I come to you with this from. In nursing school, we learn the code of ethics and what it teaches us is that we have a responsibility to reduce health disparities and address social inequity. And this, this is right in front of us. Pouring money into the police department is not what makes or keeps our community safe and inclusive and connected and engaged and fulfilled community that can count on having the basics of its hierarchy of needs met is what's gonna make Amherst the safest. To that end, I'm asking that you reinvest 52% of the police budget in creating a more community-based public safety process. Folks with mental health issues are actually much more likely to be the victims of violent crimes than to commit them. And yet the way that the policing works out, they end up getting hurt by the system that is meant to protect them. I just spent two years, including 72 hours behind a locked ward, and I barely feel confident to serve these most vulnerable members of our community. I, I can't imagine for the life of me that that the police training that they receive, and, and to be fair, I do not know about, about the exact certification that they receive, gives them what they need to do that. Um, I heard something in the call that, that the police specifically said they felt like they were getting railed against. It's not, it's not what's happening. Again, we're talking about the budget. We're talking about the distribution of services. Massachusetts is having a mental health crisis. We're losing psychiatric beds left and right. So if there's money to be spent, why don't we spend it more directly taking care of these folks that need it instead of spending it on a service that doesn't serve them? Um, and again, to that end, I think that 52% of the budget would be better served, um, directed by the BIPOC community, community leaders to be invested in their businesses and their community. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, Casey Owen, is it? Do I have that correct? Uh, yes, that's that's correct. Hi, um, I I did speak last night. Um, today, I'd like to read a statement put forth by a disabled black uh, person who lives in Amherst and wishes to remain remain anonymous. Um, they asked us to share that they have faced numerous instances of targeted intimidation from members of the Amherst Police Department. They have faced abuse from an officer in the area who used his ties to APD to gain information and harass people he has abused. 
for this specific person, the harassment from APD has looked like unfounded wellness checks and officers showing up at their friends' places of residence without clear reason. APD has never taken accountability for this behavior. This person and others who, have exper who had experiences similar to, similar to theirs have been told by officers that they're exaggerated their experiences and only looking to ruin the police department's credibility. But what this anonymous community member wants is safety, for their well-being to be taken seriously and for town accountability for their employees' behavior, both on and off the job. As we go through the process of defunding APD and reducing our reliance on, police, on policing in Amherst, we also have to turn our attention to police accountability to ensure the immediate and present safety of community members with marginalized identities, whose experiences need to be taken seriously. This community member has the following questions for the, for the town council and APD to consider. We know that we can't get answers to these questions here, but these questions are aimed at ways for APD to be held accountable to, keep, to keeping all people in Amherst safe, rather than continuing to inflict violence on the same people it claims to be protecting. What will be put in place to ensure survivors and marginalized people are not being harassed by police? How is the town going to ensure marginalized people and survivors are not treated as the suspect if they need to ask for help from police? Who do, who do we as town people get, go to when the police are doing illegal things but are big on protecting their own? What types of training and accountability processes are going to ensure police treat people appropriately? How do we get cases, in, how do we get cases involving injustice at the police especially when it comes to bias and discrimination, looked at by an independent third party to assess and adequately hold APD accountable. I'm asking that you cut the police budget by 52% because the APD targets by BIPOC people in Amherst. This racism can, cannot be reformed away, which is why we are asking that the ADK set aside in the budget for combating structural racism to the police department instead be spent in a community directed way Guided by, but guided by compensated Black-led organizations and community members, and to place freezes on hiring and funding the APD. At the very least, only pass a one-month budget and spend that month paying a collection of BIPOC folks to give you the answers that you need on the budget. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so I'm gonna, um, that concludes public comment at this point, and so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to say one thing and then see if the council president uh, has anything to add, but uh, last night we had a budget hearing and the um, hearing was solely focused, uh, except for a couple minute introduction to set the stage, to hearing comments from the public and I think that all of us really appreciated the comments we heard. Um, there's uh, uh, we, I assure you that I was listening and um, listened again today to the comments that were received. Um, we're uh, engaged in a process going forward. We're trying to hear from all parties. Uh, this was a finance committee hearing and the finance committee has the responsibility of um, trying to understand the budget um, as proposed by the um, departments and what um, they propose to provide, we then evaluate that information. That was the purpose of today's meeting. Steps going forward um, on this issue will um, largely turn back to the full council and not be within the committee, but we really did appreciate having your comments since we will have to make a uh, budget recommendation to the council. The council will make the budget decisions. Lynn, um, as president, do you have anything to add? Uh, a couple things, yes. Uh, just as we asked last night and several people have followed through, if you would please share your written comments um, with us by emailing them to towncouncil at amherstma.gov. They have been insightful, they've been informative. Uh, all of us have come to this meeting and have learned a lot in the process. And we want to thank you for making those comments and we would like them, in addition to being part of 
this recorded meeting, as well as last night's recorded meeting, to be on the record in writing as well. Okay. Uh, anything else, Lynn? Otherwise, I think we need to turn back to the committee business really quickly. I think we um, probably have exhausted ourselves for the day today. Tomorrow, we really need to work on um, I can make my uh, phone timer stop. Um, the, uh, what, we, what we need to be doing tomorrow is trying to concentrate on what our recommendations and report are going to be looking like. Um, we were also going to have to um, just sort of see where we are in the process moving forward. Um, but we're going to, um, and I will continue to um, consult with uh, um, others, um, in particular uh, the president and the town manager, and report back on tomorrow. But tomorrow's meeting will really be to take all of the information we've received and try and move it along to the next stage. Are there comments or questions now from the committee itself regarding uh, the process that we have going forward and um, any recommendations from other members of the council? Dorothy. I just want to be clear. The, I am not able to attend the meeting tomorrow, which is Wednesday. But we have a meeting on Thursday, do we not, at 1.30? Yes. Okay. So we're not going to make a recommendation until, until Thursday. Is that right? I think we will probably take the votes on Thursday and see if we can then conclude. But uh, I can't be certain. We're trying. Um, I know that things uh, got pressured because of the complexity of the budget this year. I feel really... Um, Badly that that has uh, happened and that you ended up having um, some people had to schedule various things that uh, limited their ability to be present for some of the final meetings. I think that this has been, um, as said before, an extraordinary and unprecedented year. We're doing the best we can. I don't think we'll be doing votes tomorrow, but I can't assure you. As I you know, I had down all the meetings listed and to get here today, we drove four hours, you know, we just drove to Connecticut, did our uh, doctor's appointment, drove back, got here. You know, it's been hard and I don't want to miss it, but you know, I could not change tomorrow's event. So I, I cannot make it. I, I feel badly about that. Um, we, we do have a requirement that we have to act on the budget by the end of the month. We want to make sure that there's plenty of time for the council to be able right. to, to discuss the budget um, and uh, so that we don't want to get the, um, even though technically we were given 30 days to provide a budget once it was referred to us, mm -hmm. uh, because it was referred to us on the 29th of June, if we took to the full 30 days, we would be at the very end of the month and then we would be depriving the council as a whole of having time to discuss the budget and given the complexity of this year's budget we didn't um, i was trying to avoid doing that which is why i ended up trying to accelerate the process uh, and uh it, it has created a dilemma but and i apologize for that and I, and I moved my Thursday appointment. I mean, I finally made doctor's appointments to 8.15 so I can make it for your 1.30 meeting, doing the best I can. But I appreciate it. Um, I'm hoping that we do not take any votes tomorrow. I just don't want to assure it because I can't stop people from making motions. Uh, I will uh, follow up as best I can with, with emails to follow the meeting. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to, oh, I see several hands up. Um, so I should get back to them. Um, Lynn, did you have more? Only that our meeting on Wednesday is at 1.30 and our meeting on Thursday is at 2.30. Lynn, are you sure? Because I had it, I had it reversed. That was my question, the exact, the time for tomorrow. 
I just checked the posting, but Athena uh, is our best resource here. Because the Andy email had the July 15th at 2.30 and July 16th at 1.30. I just, uh, I'm fine with either. I just want to yeah. make sure I get it right. It he had, because that's why I changed the doctor's appointment, the dentist appointment on Thursday. Seriously. So, I, I'm, that's all it. I can say is, Athena, could you check the posting? I'll check. Okay, uh, Kathy, was that your comment? That, the, the, the question was that, and Andy, the other thing is we're trying to put a report together and various people have sent you drafts. Um, I know. No, so my, no, my, my question is, are you gonna try to put them all into one document or share pieces, or are we gonna focus just on high level recommendations um, and then pull the report together? Because I, I think high level recommendations might be a good place to focus rather than uh, eight people trying to write a report together. Um, so that was just a thought on the pieces can come together with edits to make it flow with all these different people's writing styles. So I think you have you have about four sections now and I know Lynn's couldn't be written till after today. So yeah, and there's still uh, sections missing because uh, section I was assigned to write hasn't been written, I, I admit. And yeah, it's, it's just a question purely on Yes, yeah, so I think I stated it that there's one set of high level decisions on recommendations, then there's another set on what this report looks like. And since I tend to be a read the first page of a long report and prefer to have the recommendations on that page, you know, then then I re I read the rest of it too, but I like I like the bottom line at top. <laughs> um, so Yeah. I, I mean it's sort of an interesting question because the Ultimately, the question is, are we going to recommend the budget that was proposed by the town manager? And what is it that, um, you know, in the end, the high level recommendation, if that's uh, basically what the recommendation that's is. That's my question. Yep. Uh, but we need, you know, it, it's not complex question um, in what, how to frame it. How to answer it may be complex, but uh... no, I, I do understand that, um, and I think everyone on the committee knows. I mean, the charter language doesn't allow us to move money around, so we can cut, but we can't, and we could write, you know, but we can't say spend more here, spend less there. And, right. and neither can the council. I mean, it's yeah. that we can, we can send the budget back. Um, so it's just we're in that framework. Um, yeah, that, so that was my question. You are right that we can either say we love it and say a bit more about all the pieces of it, or we can say something more. And the question is, are we saying more about a specific sections? And yeah. I think that's what we'll start to try and frame tomorrow, um, but not necessarily vote tomorrow, but we do have to start that question as to whether there's any sections of the budget in um i think we all know that there's one that's been put on the table for us whether there are others so give some thought to that question um bob yeah i was just thinking that you know in addition to the the obvious recommendation you know for the budget to accept it or to recommend it or not i think we might want to also include some assessment of risks and areas where we need to monitor going forward because circumstances could change. Risks because of revenue, risks because of cost, or you haven't defined yet? Well, risks because of uncertainty about both revenue and cost, right? I mean, we don't, there are a lot of risks because of COVID and the economy and, and everything. And so I think we just need, I, I'm just throwing that out as a, as a way to focus the report, not only on do we make a recommendation, but also on where do we see areas that need to be monitored. Okay. Um, should go back and look at our um, revised 
guidelines document. We talked about that a little bit in it. And uh, that would probably be a useful thing to do. Um, Dorothy, did you have additional comment? Um, I, I guess I'm feeling it again, something that we went through before. We get a budget, we go through it, we look at it, and then we report on it and make a few comments. But then we're told, and I'm reminded, yes, of course, we can, and this is what's true for town meeting, we can lower something, but we can't increase it. We can't move it to another place. And part of me says, well, then really, what are we doing? You know, I mean, I'm just expressing a little frustration because, you know, accountants can come and check out your budget and they have. So we're looking at things, not do the numbers add up, although we, so, you know, Kathy is trying to make sure that the numbers are in the right places and we know why they're there, but we're kind of assuming and trusting that the numbers do add up. So we're here saying, is this the document that we want to run our town on? But yet we're told we can't increase something, we can only take money away. So I, I'm feeling very hands tied and I'm sure you know what I mean, Andy, you've been working on this kind of thing for years, but tell me why this is good, okay? I, I need to be given some reasons to think why this is a good way to go. Uh, I hate to be, I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic in my answer, though it'll sound like it. Um, state law sets up the process and the charter was adopted to accommodate what the state law provides. Um, and this, so we are following what the statute, Mass General Law, um, indicates is a permissible process for uh, us to adopt the budget. And, uh, you know, the, the charter tracks the, the statute, but we are where we are. And uh, what I've tried to do as chair of the committee is to look to the guidelines document is our opportunity where we can say to the manager at the beginning, you know, this is what we would like you to consider. Um, and uh, I hope that we would engender a healthy discussion both in the finance committee and in the council about what goes in the guidelines document mm -hmm. because that's what um, the manager has to work with as far as his guidance of where the council is when he develops the budget, but the mm -hmm. process is what it is. So just a quick follow-up. So just to be sure, state law then forbids us to do what the, the strongest recommendation from some of the speakers was to defund the police department. Well, actually, that's not true because- no, we can cut. No, you can, you can cut it, but you can't put it anywhere else. In other words, the whole premise was take it from there and not just give it away, but it was supposed to go and be used in more socially constructive ways. So you so can, we're actually not allowed to do that. You can make recommendations to the town manager uh -huh. about where you would like money to go, and that is his decision to, to follow through with that or to just eliminate whatever the figure is that we're reducing something by. So that could be done within the same budget? It would still be called the budget FY21? Because I was thinking that the only alternative was to say go to the go budget. My uh, uh, expert on the subject of the charter, uh, who's our one uh, council member who is also on the Charter Commission. But uh, I think that there is process within the charter section on finance to ask that a supplemental budget be considered too. And so there are options out there. Um, I think that in the end, the council has the key question um, mm -hmm. as to whether it wants you know, what it wants to do with the recommendations that we have received from a number of members of the public. And we don't know what other members of the public we might be hearing from yet. I would appreciate it if people would hold their questions until tomorrow so that we can adjourn. I've been sitting here for four hours 
and I'm really tired and uncomfortable. I was going to suggest the same thing. Yep. And with that note, is there? Oh, let me clarify the way the meetings are posted is 1.30 tomorrow, 2.30 on Thursday. I'll switch. Thank you. I'm sorry mm -hmm. there was that confusion, but um, I, yeah, I think I, that what I was doing was close to the prior conversation. Mary Lou, did you have anything before we adjourn? Mary Lou? I don't hear from Mary Lou, then I'm going to call us adjourned. Thank you. All right. So uh, since uh, she hasn't unmuted to, uh, unless she needs help to unmute, then uh, I will consider us adjourned at 5.34 PM. And uh, I appreciate it. It has been a long meeting. Thank Thanks, you. Andy.